Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here, where the pollen is high for some, but it is 75 and beautiful for others. I am the great Brian Last, your host. Some questions, reviews, who knows what else, trouble, always trouble, with this man, the star of the drive Through, Mr. Jim Cornette. Well, Brian, I've said it many times that you are a man who the glass is always half full, and I am a man who the glass is always half empty and leaking because it's cracked at the bottom and needs to be replaced. That's just the difference in our person. So you concentrate on the the 75 and sunny, and I concentrate on the high pollen count, causing everybody to honk and snort about. But the dogwood is in bloom, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't get jacked out of that like I did um, last spring when we had screwy weather of different natures than the screwy weather we've recently had. The dogwood is in bloom. And at the top of the program, I'd like to thank everybody, including you, Brian, who called me yesterday morning as, as we're recording this. It was yesterday morning to see if I was okay after about 13 or 14 people got shot and or killed in Louisville, downtown. And I liked your reasoning. You said you heard it was the old National Bank, and a bank with an the old in the name, it sounds like a bank I would go to. It just Which, sounded, when I saw the news report, they said 845 in the morning, the old National Bank in downtown Louisville. I said, oh my God, that sounds like exactly where Jim Cornette would be. Well, see, no, no, if, if it wouldn't be downtown. You're not going to catch me downtown Louisville at 845 in the morning. That's way too early to go that far. Um, that seems like the best time to go downtown. Less traffic. I don't need to go downtown. And apparently now never shall again. Because <laughs> I've, no, in all seriousness, Stacy and I have had dinner at the fucking place that's across the street from this establishment. It's right next to Slugger Field where the Louisville River Bats play and there's restaurants and things in the area. And this is a building with, I think, not only a bank, but residences connected or whatever. Point is, disgruntled employee who had been making troubling posts, at, at least on social media, uh, it, it obtains... I don't know whether this was legal or not, but they usually are. Obtains possibly, probably legally an AR-15 in this country and goes in and shoots a bunch of people and blows the fucking uh, the front windows out of this bank while he's doing it. And with three within three minutes, they said police were on the scene. And at least one cop got shot and is still in intensive care. And then I didn't know that this was happening because I was flittering about. But when I turned on the TV in the TV room, it was already a, a broken in on the local news was going on. And they broke in on the local news with this news that, um, you know, this was still happening and nobody knew what was going on at that point, but the police hit downtown and they blocked off everything and every cop in town was there with all the big heavy equipment and the mobile crime units and people get a cell phone video of running and you hear shots being fired and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it, it, a lot of people get shot in Louisville more than ever that's been on the on television uh quite often over the last year or two but it's but we st because this is america so everybody gets shot everywhere we're fucking idiots more on that later but in louisville and or the state of kentucky does not usually have the somebody goes off with an assault rifle and fucking you know racks it up into the teens type of shootings that's still very unusual around these parts so the newscasters were breaking down in tears on the air, and the governor showed up within an hour and a half because one of his best friends was the one of the people that got killed in the bank. And so the point is, obviously, uh, most of the people work there, I believe. I don't know whether they—I think they got a few innocent bystanders. 
and the police officer. But it's fucking ridiculous. And this guy, and they said that this guy had possibly reached out, left a message for a friend on a, a voicemail. I may have to do something. I don't know what the fuck. This is a, and listen to this quote. I don't, I, this wasn't the mayor. The mayor was on the scene also because somebody just shot at the mayor when he was running for mayor last year. Just some random nut with a handgun fired one shot. If one of the other local officials, this was a quote that I wrote down. He is definitely calling to see if there are ways to prevent people with serious mental illnesses from buying assault rifles. He said that out loud. What the fuck? It's come to, do you think there are any ways, Brian, that we can prevent people with serious mental illnesses from buying assault rifles? How about you got to be a fucking corporal in the goddamn Marine Corps first or higher? We are, as I've said this before, as a country, Americans are the stupidest people on earth. Because we act like, oh, what if we could only do something? Yes, you fucking morons. Don't sell every jack leg wandering down the street with his finger in his nose, a fucking automatic weapon. Restrict the kinds of guns that can be bought by the general population and or numbers of same, and you would, you would be doing something. But because we have the delusional fantasies that we were brought up on, whether it was the cowboy and Indians movies, we had to shoot all the Indians because they got aggressive when we tried to steal all their fucking property. So we glorified that and grew up on the movies and the TV show, and then fucking everybody wants to be Rambo and blah, blah, blah. And you're not patriotic if you don't, according to some sources, about half of the country over here, you're not patriotic if you believe that anyone's access to any kind and any amount of guns should be restricted because of the Constitution. You're supposed to love your country. I love Castle Cornet, but I recognize when the water softeners need to be replaced because they're outdated and not serving their purpose anymore, and they can be remodeled and renewed to reflect the current situation. Doesn't mean I want to sell the fucking house and move to Russia. But uh, apparently, we have not produced any smart people in this country in the last 250 years because the founding fathers, even though that the Second Amendment, as we all know, anybody intelligent and most of the goddamn people that have studied it in the Supreme Court until modern times, the Second Amendment has been grossly misinterpreted by the domestic terrorist organizations like the National Rifle Association in order to raise money for the gun manufacturers who make hundreds of millions of dollars every year selling more guns to people who are scared that people with guns are going to shoot them. But nevertheless, the, pe the founding fathers wrote the Constitution 250 years ago, and we have not gotten any smarter since then, apparently, because they say that even though we've amended it so many 40 fucking times and changed it back and forth about every other subject in the world, the one perfect thing they did that nobody's ever been able to fucking top was the Second Amendment. This coming from a generation that still owned slaves, and it was commonplace at that point in time to shit in the street. But we're not allowed to touch that shit. So as long as everybody's got all their delusional fantasies about being the hero of the Wild West or the Die Hard movie or the best of being patriotic enough to being stockpiling weapons so that you can overthrow your own government 
to show your patriotism, we're all going to get shot. So that's just, so just, you know, try to limit your public exposure. And if, if you needs to go to certain places at certain times where there'll be a lot of people around, get a bulletproof vest. Because there's, there's obviously no solution. There's no correlation at all between our ridiculous attitudes on public ownership of goddamn munitions and the fact that we're the only country on earth where shit like this takes place. Can't be any possible link. So, yes, a bunch of people are shot, a bunch of people are dead. Wasn't me this time. Who knows what it might be. I'll probably be one of the last ones because you don't get a good shot at me most of the time. But if you have to, if you have to send your kids to school or go out in fucking public to go to grocery except during off-peak hours or go to your job where somebody that works there might not like it, you're fucked. Go ahead, Brian. I don't really have too much to add to that. Um, the only thing I will say is that every other country that experiences one of these things with a automatic or semi-automatic weapon and a mass killing, they make adjustments, they make amendments, they change things, they fix things, the problem goes away. There's only one country that doesn't do that. And unfortunately, it's ours. There's only one country that has the National Rifle Association. There's only one country that has... And I'm not saying that any Democrat doesn't ever take money from the National Rifle Association. I'm saying any Democrat that does take money from the National Rifle Association should be hounded out of office. Uh, but the Republicans primarily... The Law and Order Party want everybody to have a fucking gun and they get tens of millions of dollars apiece from the gun manufacturers through the NRA to do that, which is another reason why I advocate the voting out of office of every goddamn Republican you can find, because it'll save your kids' lives in the long run. But we're the only country that has that. And a lot of people <laughs> point to the pride. We're the only country that has a Second Amendment. Yeah, see what it got us? Fuck. It's like being, we're, we're the only country in the world with a fucking toxic dump the size of Brazil in the middle of our fucking land. There was once an amendment that banned alcohol, and then there was another amendment that repealed that. It's not like there can't be changes. Oh, yes. Well, we, we mentioned they, they, um, um, an amendment is basically a fancy word for, oh, here's shit we forgot or didn't do right the first time. And they've not only changed their minds or added numerous things, but they've changed their minds about some of the times they've changed their minds. So, what the fuck? Uh, but anyway, I don't mean to drag things into the political realm. It's just the realm of stupidity that we talk about here, and there's so much out there flying around in the wild. Uh... Should I should I bring something up that before, before it's your show, Brian? I know this, but should I bring something up where people have actually done something good for someone and other people before we go any further? No, who wants to hear that kind of crap? Well, I know sometimes it doesn't make the headlines. Take your hippy dippy stuff and stick it. Well, we're, we're no, we're going to save the planet here because jacked up Jeremy Bagley. And I don't know what the other, the uh, Mark Goodson production is his name on Twitter. I don't know if that's actually his name or not, Mark Goodson. We're going to call him Mark for the sake There's of There's no it. way. There's no way that's his well, name. Well, but, but it would be so, <laughs> so cool if it was, and he was just parodying that. But anyway, nevertheless, everybody knows that this weekend at jimcornett.com, uh, the Spring Spectacular sale started, including the new breast cancer pink and black action figures that we have on sale 1,000 autographed figures. $10 from every figure sold goes to the American Cancer Society. And I just saw on Twitter this morning that jacked up Jeremy Bagley and Mark Goodson uh, agreed to donate an additional $500 apiece when all the figures are sold. And then Mark came back and said, fuck it, 
He couldn't wait, and in honor of, I believe, his father, and I've lost the tweet here now, the fucking scrolled, uh, he went ahead and donated his 500 already. And, and by the way, we have already sold more than 500 of the available figures in the last 72 hours, so that's 500, that's $5,000 from the Cult of Cornette through the Cornette's collectible sale, and we got another $1,000 pledged just because Bagley and Goodson can't be one-upped. So how about them apples? You're you're supposed to talk about them apples. Now. I wouldn't call them apples. They are fine members of the cult of Cornet. No, I don't. I wasn't calling them. I know. Apples. I, I said know. That about them. I wasn't calling them any kind of fruit or even vegetables for that matter. For heaven's sake! But what about and tofu? also, if you want to jump in and 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 get some money for, uh, raised up for a good cause, also. Uh, then, as I said, almost over 500 are gone. We're in the bottom half now, and they're still going quickly, as well as the Inside the Ropes December 2022 issue that I'm on the cover and the big interview inside, six pages. That's uh, can be personally autographed, and we only have 1,000 of those, and we're down to about 500 of those. And the Inside the Ropes DVD of the London show in October 2016 with myself and Jim Ross, as well as the Lazy Booking t-shirts, the Cornette Face t-shirts, and so much more at jimcornette.com. But we've done something good for people here over the past couple days. Now it's your show. Oh, great, because it's been such a banner show so far. Well, and now, see, it's got nowhere to go but up now once you take over. Well, you know what? Let's go up right now let's talk about something that is a fun topic that i'm sure you'll enjoy talking about wwe biography this past weekend on a and e had what may be well i think what definitely is the best biography of this season yeah but it may be the best one they've done so far I remember they did a good bret hart one and there's been a few other ones but the dusty Rhodes biography aired this past weekend jim yeah and this was the best one i think of all of them not only because they did such a as thorough a job as you could do for a career like that in two hours, but also it was not only informative, it was not only well done, but it was fun to watch for once. It was fun. There weren't, there were sad parts, but overall you came out smiling out of the thing. It wasn't like, uh, you know, it just, it, it checked all the boxes for me. And I mean, before we talk about the program in, with any specificity as far as what was in it, just the footage and the pictures of Dusty at any point in his career, especially because they, they've got the Florida Library, they had so much good stuff there, but they had the the McGurk TV studio with Reese Bout. Uh, no, not Ray, what, it was Boyd Pierce uh, introducing Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch, the Outlaws, and all the old pictures and clippings that obviously they got from the family and, and, you know, great research. The th whole thing is it showed his emotion, the passion, the energy, the charisma, whether it was the promos had the cadence and the delivery and the inflection. And because he could go from goofiness to melodrama in the same promo, but you believed it because everything came with sincerity. And when he was making goofy faces and saying goofy things, it wasn't because he was acting goofy. I re I've lived through this era, not in Florida, but just when Dusty was, you know, was young and getting over. And a lot of the fans just said they believed he was goofy, not that he was acting goofy. That fucking goofy Dusty, he's like the goddamn, he's like my cousin fucking Virgil or whatever. Except then... Virgil, of all the names? Well, I'm just saying, I'm making that up. But I, people would say, like, I know a guy like him, or yeah, he's like my fucking boss, or he's like my goddamn cousin that I fuck, or a guy I went to school with. He's goofy like that. But they believed he was goofy, and then he could turn it on and be an ass kicker rather than... He was acting goofy. They didn't know about gimmicks. They didn't know what the fuck. Dusty could make you believe him. 
and it, it whatever I've talked about Gunther being a perfect wrestler because he never does anything in the ring that he really shouldn't do even when he's with guys that don't fit him stylistically Dusty could get away with all that shit but he never said shit that Dusty wouldn't say or in a different way otherwise than what Dusty would say it do you, do you see what I mean he knew what he could get away with he had the funky side and he had the serious side and the vowing vengeance side and then doing an interview with a fucking gorilla. Yeah, I got a fucking gorilla here. You know, it 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 all worked for him because it was him. It was real. And I just, I, you see the people, the pictures in, uh, there's a famous picture from Detroit when he won the Sheik's U.S. I don't know if he beat the Sheik for it, but he won the, the U.S. title that was the old Sheik belt with the United States fucking shaped plate on the front of it and there's all the fans at the Kobo have jumped up on the apron of the ring and they're holding him. it may have been Brad McFarlane it may have been Brian Buchanis I don't know who took this picture but there's black kids and there's white kids and there's young blonde teenage girls and they're all reaching for him and hugging him and you saw pictures like that when he won the uh they had the footage of him beating Harley for the title in 79 and they sent the baby faces in the ring for a celebration, but then the people fucking jump up there and they're overwhelmed with the rings, overwhelmed with the fans. They were joyous about it because that's how much they got into him. And um, there was footage, of, not to jump ahead, but there was yeah. footage of one match from Florida, him and Ernie Ladd. Yes. And the people were losing their shit. And I was getting into it. I wish it wasn't so clipped. Of just Ernie selling for the elbow. You know, that's the thing is you see the people going crazy. And a lot of it was the, well, the footage with the, not to get ahead, but Billy Graham in Madison Square Garden. Those people were jumping up and down. They loved Billy Graham. Remember at the time, Billy Graham was the most popular heel champion they'd ever had. They loved him in New York. He sold out every time he defended. But they, they loved Dusty and the fucking wiggle and the walk and the strut and the jive and the but they think about this. They had been fed a diet of pretty straight laced fucking baby faces in terms of Bruno and Pedro, you know, pretty clear cut baby face people that straight ahead fight with honor type of thing. And and that's why they reacted to Graham with the patter and the body and the promo and the whole night. But then they get dusty. And he's talking, and even, did you hear the clip when Vince Jr., as the announcer in 1977, was interviewing Dusty? He was trying to do Dusty. He was trying to be funky. He said, it's the American dream. He was almost imitating Dusty, the man that's funky. That and is one of those New words York that Vince fell that. in love with. Vince fell in love with the word funky around there, because every now and then, yeah. years later, you would just hear, like, funky, like, just yeah. <laughs> on one of the shows. But yeah, well, you're even though that's the generation right before you as a fan, you as a historian know that it had been pretty straight laced with the baby faces in the Northeast to that point, and then here comes Dusty and talking like that and looking like that and doing all that bullshit, and people loved it. So yeah, my dad had a friend who always talked about a friend who would come over and watch, you know, baseball, basketball, football with my dad. But he would go on his own to the garden in the 70s, as he always said, to see Dusty Rhodes. Well, and that would 1977, Dusty was still in Florida. And of course, they went through, well, not to skip over this program completely, but they covered his early years. Um, the debut in, in Dallas program, I love, but I'm trying to, was it, was it Dusty that, I don't think he just walked right into Sportatorium or was it the Sportatorium where he basically bluffed his way into business by telling him that he'd been trained when he hadn't. And then he kind of got his foot in the door and got booked. Well, remember he went to West Texas state. So he is already very familiar with wrestlers or yes, families of that's, wrestlers. That's why I'm saying, I think he went somewhere and dropped some names and okay. <laughs> but anyway, they had his, his brother, Larry is cool as shit, isn't he? Yeah, and he looks Dusty nothing like Trump. Dusty because there was a picture of them, must be from 25 years ago, 
you think, oh, maybe back then they looked alike. And there's Dusty, and there's Larry with long, dark hair. <laughs> yeah, no, like never him. looked anything like. But Really cool guy, though. And Dave Zirin, who they identified as the sports editor of The Nation, may be the best non-wrestling personality talking head they've ever had. I thought that guy did a great job, and I'm very critical of every one of these goofs they usually wheel out on these shows. <laughs> this guy did a good job, a really good job. Yes, and knowledgeable and insightful and added to the program. I think that's the first time I've ever said that about anybody of, of the talking head variety. And they, like I said, they had some, you know, footage of Rhodes and Murdoch, the Texas Outlaws, the, uh, so the uh, clip of the bar scene from The Wrestler. Did you know that the Midnight Express went 30 minutes Broadway for the NWA World Tag Team title with the Texas Outlaws in Chicago one time? I did not know that. 30 minutes, really? Um, in 1988, that uh, fucking... <laughs> the five weeks between when... Or six weeks between when Tully and Arn quit and dropped the belts to us and then Dusty turned the Road Warriors heel to replace Tully and Arn with another heel team. We were the World Tag Team Champions. And remember, I'd been managing Dick Murdoch and then he switched babyface yeah. to help Dusty. In 87. And, uh, no, well, this was 88. No, you managed him in 87. Oh, well, yeah, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, so Dusty, I j just booked it one one time, I guess for old time's sake, so he and Dick could team for us to defend the belts because we weren't technically full baby faces at that point. And Dusty and Dick were, and in Chicago, where they had worked in the AWA, then we got there, and he, I guess he realized, well... I don't want to beat the Texas Outlaws in Chicago, even with the Midnight Express. <laughs> of course. But I don't want to go an hour. <laughs> so he had us go 30 minutes Broadway for the world tag title. Was Murdoch into it that night? Yeah, it, well, yes, because he liked, you know, the Midnight. He liked me. and I mean, he was having fun. It, it, the house was only, as I recall, about 65 grand. So that was... You know, not any uh, anything to write home about, but we had a fun match. It was just, it was a house show match, not taped or anything. But a match like that, could Dusty have fun? With all the backstage drama that was happening with Crockett Promotions and the impending Turner sale and Arn and Tully leaving, which ties into both of those things, was he able to go in the ring and have a good time and leave all that behind? Yes. I mean, and again, it's not like that they were, you know, fucking taking every bump that they did as the Texas outlaws as heels, blah, blah, blah. He was having more fun at that point than working hard, but it was still a fun match because it's dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch. Anyway. Um, but Cody did a wonderful job in this. I thought, uh, again, the montage of promo clips and this is with, I understand when they've done the biographies of the modern era guys, you know, that they have to, the names that most of the viewing audience remembers these days and the Austins and Undertakers and whatever. But when you be able to go back and just dig deep in some of the Florida and Georgia clips and finally have a guy that was, because there are no promo clips from the Attitude Era. There's clips of in-ring interviews and things, but there's no just the steady, the one-liners and the selling the thing and the hyping the thing. And I think Dave Zirin was one of the guys that made mention of, and they had another young lady that was a, an author is how she was identified. But Dusty, it was like music, the flow of it, the black church service promo. Where he was preaching to people, and he kind of took some shit from Thunderbolt Patterson. Yeah, he gave him credit to actually show Thunderbolt here, and that looked yeah. beautiful, that clip. And, well, you're talking about the restored video, not yeah. the fact that Thunderbolt was uh, that attractive of a, a man. But Certainly not. The restored video. Yes. And, well, and, and also, you know, again, there's Hulk Hogan. Everybody with Flair put him over, called Dusty over, called him a genius. And Hogan's putting him over in his own way, but he's got to bring himself into it. He's like, see that when I raised the finger, brother? You know, the one finger up in the air started, that was Dusty Rhodes all day long. I saw that when I was nine years old. And somebody pointed out on Twitter that Hogan was like fucking 17 when <laughs> Dusty was turned babyface doing the finger or whatever the fuck. Nine years old. Get out of yeah. here. Yeah. 
And of course, and, and Cousin Bruce, the artful Dodger, had to get his Dusty Rhodes impersonation in. And then I loved the music video again, the action stuff in the ring. The can't judge a book by looking at the cover video. I remember seeing that years ago. I'm talking 40 fucking years ago. Um, and all that Florida action. And there's where you're to with Ernie Ladd. And there was, I think, Cyclone Negro in there. And, and the, the stuff with uh, Pac Song. And, you know, again, more pictures. Although with they didn't show the turn. I was surprised because they referenced the Pac Song Nam feud. But they didn't show the actual moment he turned on, or they turned on Dusty, Gary Hart, and Pac Song. Well, but I think then, not only would that have required them to set it up properly, it would have required them to take about a 10-minute detour and explain the, the strife that had been going on, even though Dusty was a heel, but the people were starting to like him, and there was the trouble in the Gary Hart army and then uh, Eddie Graham stepped in and led the people the way they were going to begin with and then and then the footage of the turn would have been they were kicking a shit out of Dusty and he was laying there bleeding he wasn't really shining so I get but you could tell that Dusty had in the sit down that they had done with him several years ago that they included also he had probably told the story in more detail and then they clipped it like that but it, you got the general gist of the thing the american dream began as the counterpoint to the korean assassin i wish tc lee would have got some credit it is interesting though that you know they talked about dusty's way of speaking and how it was a way to connect beyond white or black everyone kind of connected with that guy think at gary hart who was kind of the opposite end of that i thought gary hart was black when i was a kid yeah by that point he was bald and i thought because of the way he spoke and he seemed like he could be black. I thought he was black. So you have him and Dusty going back and forth on promos. That really must have been something. Well, and also, and Gary was, <laughs> even when he was in Charlotte, Gary was a tanner. So he was always tan. And in Florida, you could imagine. And he had that way of speaking because he grew up. And we've talked about Gary's background before, where he grew up in, in Chicago, was an inner city part of town, and he actually worked alongside with, occasionally for, the fucking connected people, and also had a heavily African-American influence in his neighborhood, and that's, he came up with that way of speaking. Just, it, was, it was his, and he didn't really magnify it on the air, he just tried to sound a little more menacing. Then Uncle Gary would sound in the locker room, but he had the, would you like some corn, brother? You know. But anyway, and obviously juxtaposing all of the, the you know, in-ring stuff and the professional stuff, they were telling a story of E again, like a lot of the guys. He had a family early and a family later. His first two kids were Dustin and Kristen. And he wasn't there as much for them because that was the territory days. That's, that's when he was on the road and ended up getting divorced from his first wife. And then met Mich and Michelle, who is his second wife, obviously, she was involved in, in heavily in this. She did a great job, too. Isn't she just fantastic at, at speaking in such a way that the people knew what she was saying, but you didn't have to be a real wrestling nerd? Like when she said, instead of, one time, instead of saying Dusty wanted to be a booker, she said, Dusty always wanted to produce wrestling. And everybody could understand that. So, but anyway, um, they got a nice shot of the flip-flop and fly-in on, on Bobby Eaton. I remember that match. That was during the 86 Bash Tour somewhere. And, you know, uh, without directly saying it, they, I mean, well, they kind of did, but they indirectly alluded to the fact that he turned down Vince before Vince went with Hulk Hogan. Well, that's where I was going to go next is that they had, they kind of told the story, but didn't, maybe somebody did tell it and they clipped it that way where it's not a, you know, they never said it nor denied it that Vince was going to go with Dusty if Hogan had not been there or Dusty got the it, it, obviously Vince had liked Dusty so much in 77 and Vince and Eddie Graham had that 
relationship that we've talked about many times. We talked about the Graham brothers. We talked about Vince Sr. in the old days of the WWF. And Dusty had been in Florida where he was the hottest attraction that they'd had since Eddie Graham in the 60s. And obviously, 20 years later, Florida's so much bigger. Dusty was the hottest ever. And he was drawing him huge money, but at the same time, he had become an attraction on Superstation TBS. Eddie Graham wanted his top guy in Florida to be one of the biggest stars in the entire business. He'd sent him to Georgia to work the Omni and to talk on TBS, and he'd send him out for limited shots with the WWWF. Remember, Kevin Sullivan said that Eddie's philosophy, once that Dusty was so over, was you got to send him out sometimes so you can get somebody else in Florida over while he's gone because nobody can get over Dusty. And he'd do that, and he was making Dusty a valuable commodity, but since Eddie was still so powerful in the NWA, he knew he was based there, and he wasn't going to burn out his golden goose. And then he gave Dusty the book down there, did he not? For the, the first run that Dusty was a booker, he, he booked Florida for a period of time with Eddie, right? Well, remember, the interesting thing is to this period of time, 1983, Dusty's booking Florida. Vince is setting everything up to go national. Dusty still makes dates at the Garden, so the connection's yeah. still there. Vince Sr., and not everyone realized Vince Sr. wasn't in charge anymore. In fact, most people didn't, at least until the summer of 83. But Vince Sr. and Eddie Graham still have a good relationship. Florida TV is still airing in New York. They get J.J. Dillon on a garden show as late as, I think, May of 84. But Dusty, it's an interesting thing to think that if he was presented with the two options, the way they presented it here, of go to the WWF, Vince Jr. is going to try to go national, you'll be his top star, or leave Florida to become the producer or the booker for Jim Crockett Promotions, and you finally get to do what you'll never have an opportunity to do in the WWF. It's interesting that you'd never hear it just put that way. And at that yeah. same time, Bill Watts was starting to use Dusty on TV too, so who knows what he was talking about with Watts. But think, think about that, that decision. That's kind of very similar to a decision that Cody had to make a year or so ago, wasn't it? When you think about it, in, in, in some respects. And he you, went the other way. Well, but, but the thing is, do you go with what you always wanted to do, or do you go with what may be a safer proposition where you're already established? But I don't it, know if Cody always wanted to do that the way Dusty did. That's my point. No, Cody always wanted to go back and win the title in the garden for his daddy. Yeah. It was the same type of decision, just not in the same direction. And that's, you know, that's the thing is that Dusty had fed the idea for Starcade to Crockett. We know that. That's how he got the booking job because during the, the great slaughter and Kernodal against Steamboat, Steamboat, I'm sorry, Ricky. Steamboat that was and when he Youngblood. gained weight. Yes. Oh, quit. He's never gained weight. Steamboat and Youngblood feud. Uh, the the bookers were Dory and um, oh goddamn, they had the three state deal going on. Was Ernie Ladd booking one state? Uh, Dory was booking one state, and Gary Hart. Gary Hart was booking this North and South Carolina and Virginia. They split them up, but nevertheless, Dusty had the idea for Starcade, a mega show in the center of the the Carolinas territory based on how they drew for that, you know, incredible cage match that blew off that tag team program. And Dusty always saw, and, and closed circuit. I mean, Dusty, you know, admits that he was influenced by Muhammad Ali. So he, he saw boxing closed circuit. Cody, everybody else said Dusty saw wrestling as a movie, as cinema. So he didn't want to just do the big house show. He This was before pay-per-view. He wanted to do the big TV show that you got paid for. And that launched, you know, Starcade and Crockett Promotions going into... Crockett had three eras before 74, 75, before George Scott came in and they decided to 
changed the tone of the territory after the whole thing with Jim Crockett Sr. had died and John Ringley committed professional suicide. They had been in just a small time, but steady, consistent, tag team oriented territory with the same regional stars running and drawing incredibly well in most of the small buildings and a few of the big buildings. And then from 74, 75 to 83, they had expanded their own TV truck, running all the bigger buildings in the towns now. And the fucking late 70s boom with Flair and Valentine and Andersons and Piper and Steamboat and etc. But they were still a big regional territory. But now he's seeing the opportunity. They've got their own TV truck. This was before TBS came along that Crockett was on TBS, but Dusty was already able to be on TBS because of the level of star he was. And as well, Georgia and the Carolinas had always worked together because they were next door to each other and because Ole Anderson, a lot of times booking one or both, and there was a natural synergy so i think at that point dusty saw my god i and he's big and he's the biggest star in florida he's huge in atlanta he's been intermittently to the carolinas but not that much but if he goes in as the booker he's brand new and fresh he figured he can take over in one fell swoop the entire southeast and be the booker in the top baby face for the only company that's on a the level to challenge Vince McMahon. He had to take that. You've always been the biggest public proponent of Dusty's booking, even when there are things that you can't avoid talking about because there were mistakes, at least the way things look nowadays. You've always yes. been the person to point to the positives and talk about well, the and good I things. Don't, and I don't cover up the Dusty finish being done three times in a row in Greensboro and all that other stuff, but it, for people not to focus on the fact that it only dropped that far because he got it that high to begin with. That's not fair either. How do you think adding TBS into the mix changed his booking? If it did. Because he didn't expect that, obviously, when he went to work there. Well, but at the same time, you know, it's like, wow, I didn't expect a million dollars to fall onto my front porch today, but I'm not un upset about it. Um, I think it... it, it obviously enabled him to have more television time to do more different things. That's what I loved about what Dusty did from 80, especially in 86 through 88, was that he would, since he had two hours of syndicated television that Crockett did every week, that was our Tuesday night TV taping somewhere around Charlotte with the Nemo truck that then they'd drive back to Charlotte They'd recorded everything live to tape. They'd roll the fucking, uh, they'd do the dubs overnight. We'd go Wednesday and roll the local promos into them for Harrisburg, Pennsylvania or wherever, and they'd send them out by bus. That's how it worked in those days. But those shows were primarily to promote the local house shows. And that's why they contained the local promos. Now they were on local broadcast television, but we had those in, you know, 80 or 90 or 100 markets, even at that point, across the country. With TBS, he could just get the talent over, give them wins, whether it be squashes or occasionally something halfway competitive. He could give the guys just promos to talk about. Yes, that was the primary way of selling the Omni, but wrestling fans around the country already looked at the Omni as kind of like the Madison Square Garden of the NWA to begin with, so everybody expected that to be talked about. But at the same time, you could just talk about the people you were mad at and what you were going to do without having to get too specific about dates and places and smarten people up that this match was happening 25 times next month. It, the TBS was great ways to promote the Bash Tour or the as pay-per-views came along or Starcade, the big event that everybody across the country can see or be a part of or travel to somewhere close to them. And TBS was also great for when he would do the one-off match. And I mean, he did them with a variety of people, but he did them with the midnight a lot. Cause I think he liked the way that I cut the promos and sold them. Whether, I mean, why else would they advertise 
The Midnight Express defends the U.S. Tag Team title against Randy and Bill Mulkey in their hometown of Anderson, South Carolina. We had TV in fucking Greenville or Spartanburg, and we could have sold it out by just doing the promos there, but he's, he promoted it on TBS because it fit into the story of Jimmy Crockett trying to fuck with us, and it was a way to do some entertaining shit and talk about a different match without giving, because that was the only place that one was going to happen. Never happened before or since. Or the eight-man, eight-person tag with Misty Blue in Baltimore, where it was me and the Midnight and Murdoch against Dusty and I think it was Nikita and Wyndham and Misty Blue. We didn't do that. We just did it one place. We talked about it on TBS. It drew $100,000. He would he could do shit like that with TBS that made things bigger or gave you more time to flesh guys out. Whereas the syndicated TV was squash, interview at the set, go to the break, do the local promo, come back, do the same fucking thing. A lot of people said, I can make money with Misty Boo. Dusty's the only one who did it. The only one who ever did. That's the only six-figure game <laughs> she ever main evented. I'll guarantee goddamn tell you that. When do you think the TBS show became the number one show? For the promotion. Well, it again, it depends on what you determine the number one show. Because more people watched it than the syndicated TV, probably overall, but more people in Charlotte, North Carolina, or in Greensboro, probably were watching the syndicated TV than were watching TBS because of not only the limited amount of cable penetration at that point, but also because that was their habit. Right. That was their, that was their, you know, they'd had a habit for years of watching the local Crockett wrestling show on their local station to find out who was coming to the Coliseum or who was going to Greensboro, who was fucking whatever. So yeah, mid Atlantic championship wrestling and worldwide wrestling still existed. Although one of them had a different name. It was the same time slots, same TV stations. Right. And in again, in Charlotte, North Carolina, which besides for Atlanta in the 80s was the second biggest market in the Southeast, Crockett's local wrestling program, the syndicated programs as we called them, were, there were, I'm trying to think, in 1986, there were five TV st broadcast TV stations in Charlotte, three networks and two strong independents, and Crockett had a show on three of them. He actually, they actually had to add a third show, which was, I think Tony Schiavone sat and hosted it in the fucking studio in front of a monitor. And it was a 30 minute show, Super Bouts or something like that, because the TV station wanted more fucking wrestling. That, so their ratings were immense in the local markets that they'd always had. But as they spread out, people in Albuquerque might not have picked up right away on watching worldwide wrestling on, you know, KXBQ channel four. That's only been on there three months, but they've been watching TBS wrestling for years if they had cable. So it just depended on where you were. What'd you think about when Dusty's wife said that when they moved to Charlotte, it was just a giant wasteland. <laughs> well, I think it, <laughs> And honestly, Charlotte has sprouted as a banking center and a major metropolis. And since I've been back, I hate it compared to the way it was in the 80s. It still kind of was like a small, green, tree-forested southern town. But Magnum may have said it best. It was, it was like a, a bowl of oatmeal with no sugar, is kind of what he said. Because before Dusty went there... Remember, again, George Scott had only been gone for, what, about a year and a half at that point, or even that long, and George Scott's method of booking worked in the Carolinas, but was dry in terms of the entertainment value compared to what Dusty shot in, and they were used to the biggest stars in wrestling in the Carolinas, but they they hadn't seen all of a lot of the wacky angles that Southern wrestling was known for. So Dusty brought the razzmatazz and that was the, the third boost. They went from the regional territory to the fucking Cadillac territory to now it's the, my God, we're fucking selling out and running stadiums going national territory. What do you and, think? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was no, just, I was just, yeah. 
Oh, we're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna eat. Yeah, both that, the same yeah and you and you. What do you think a booker or a promoter could learn lesson wise from Dusty? Because he was the booker and he did some extraordinary things and had an extraordinary growth in '86. But there was also, and it was going back to the beginning, the complaints about he made himself the central figure in everything. I remember, I think '84 Mid Atlantic, Flair goes to Blackjack Mulligan's ranch at night where there's like a barbecue to find him and recruit him to be his tag team partner. And there's Dusty in the background. Just make sure he was seen on camera. What do you think about, you know, how do you do it right? How do you do it wrong if you are your own top babyface star and also the booker? Well, for one thing, still at that point in time, do you blame Schwarzenegger or Stallone for starring in their own movie? What bigger star is available to them? People can say, well, Ric Flair was a bigger star. Well, Ric Flair was Dusty's opponent or the opponent that he had in mind. If they weren't working together, they were planning the next fucking run. There was nobody bigger that wasn't uh, uh, launched for Vince already at that point. Piper and Hogan, Dusty and Flair. So, yes, he had to put himself on top and it drew money. The 87 downturn in business was not solely due to Dusty's booking, but it was due to a lot of the things that Dusty had to get involved in booking. It was as a result of those territories falling by the wayside and Crockett buying them, snatching them, taking talent. Talk about, I'm not even talking about the UWF, and yes, I agree, they didn't do a good job with that, but the problem was UWF had no core territory business to support them like Charlotte had a core territory business to support them so they could have done a dueling blah, blah, blah. But if you're the booker, is it a bigger problem when you're one of the biggest stars in the business and you put yourself on top, or is it a bigger problem when you get 15 new fucking guys that you got to figure out what to fucking do with? And TBS didn't dilute Dusty's booking when they had to, when they went from two hours of syndication in the Carolinas to five hours total because there was three hours of TBS. That was great. When they then went to, well, we got a couple hours of this mid South show. And by the way, we got TV from Florida from that territory and Kansas city. We just bought them. The Batten twins need to be doing something. It, then it got ridiculously muddled. And then in, in the early part of 88, they just folded a lot of that shit up when they found out they were in money trouble, cash flow trouble. And if you'll notice, when they stopped doing so many of the regional television shoots and was dil diluted the schedule and blah, 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 and had the roster at least um, uh, under some semblance of order, from March of 88 through the 88 bashes, he got the business back. The 88 bashes did good business, and then Flair and Luger rematches and Midnight Tully and Arn coming out of it were setting some records because they got bogged down in 87 with all those multiple TV tapings and influxes of territories and rosters, and it went shit for a while. But he got it back by the summer of 88, but it was too late because... Crockett, who since before he passed away, ultimately took responsibility on himself. He didn't know where he was financially, and he bought a bill of goods as far as not only the syndicated television revenue that was coming in, but also getting blocked on pay-per-view when they had, if they had just been able to be carried on those first two pay-per-views that Vince blocked, they would have eventually got the $2 million they were in the hole when they found out about it. But they, that never happened. Did I just drone on and put you to sleep? No, you're giving great analysis here. And another thing in the program, the biography program that I liked was they obviously gave him credit, as they should, for inventing war games or launching the Great American Bash Tour. And I told you this when we talked yesterday on the phone, they showed a page, they still have Dusty's 86 book. And I remember seeing that fucking book 
in sitting in front of me on the plane with Dusty, on Dusty's lap when he's writing in it on multiple occasions. And they showed the page from the bash at Charlotte Memorial Stadium, July the 5th. And it, when I've taught, if anybody recorded this program and wants to go back and freeze frame that point, when I've talked about bookers doing their booking book, Dusty did everything in shorthand and very little writing down. Just basically you would have a guy's first name or last name or initials, depending on what he called people. I was JC, you know, or, you know, he would write Dusty T.A. Doll for the Dusty Magnum and Baby Doll and an X in between the opponents. And, you know, that's kind of it in in his red you know, a uh, fucking yearly ledger book, but you saw the number 234,000 written slanted diagonally on the left-hand side. That was where he recorded the gate. It was $234,000, which in, and in 1986, I don't have the inflation calculator in front of me, but stuff we've been doing research on, That'd be somewhere around what six hundred, six hundred fifty thousand maybe dollars in twenty twenty three money, as they say. So he he did closing in on a three quarter of a million dollar gate at a stadium in Charlotte that was one of the shows of the week. And and I I love seeing that book again and seeing the and the, the double main event. It's a double cage, R.M. versus Flair. WT, Ricky Morton versus Flair world title, and Dusty T.A. and Dahl versus Midnight Express and J.C., we were in a six-person cage. And then you they didn't pan down any further. I couldn't see from that. But I remember the commercial Ric Flair used to do for the video. And Baby Doll looking so fine finally gets her hands <laughs> on that weaselly little Jim Cornette. <laughs> uh, and then they went into the Flair and Dusty rivalry. And the back and forth promos where they juxtaposed the idea, and old cousin Dave there was valuable again here. Flair was the fucking rich, successful college football star, had the women and the nice cars, and Dusty was the son of the plumber that didn't dress nice and had a fat belly and everybody could identify with. And the way that they did it back and forth with the editing, but that was again that was part for people this was almost 40 years ago now and to to us actually even to me you were just a young whippersnapper but seeing the people and hearing the people talk about it and going to the arenas every night that was a a great encapsulation of the way that the fan the average fans not the smart fans of the day who despised dusty cuz he was fat and didn't do a great cross body all 1,400 of those people in the United States at that point in time. But that was the way that the fans thought of both of of them at that point. And Magnum had a great quote. He said that Dusty could depict violence that's not common today. When when every, the angles that they did, that he came up with, he wanted everything to have the maximum impact. If it was supposed to be funny, he wanted to be funny as possible without exposing the business. But if he wanted it to be violent, he wanted the people to believe that it was as violent as possible. And that's when everybody went the extra mile when they broke his leg in Atlanta. Everybody carried him out of the ring. And they showed footage of him on Crockett's plane with the fucking ice bag on his leg screaming in pain there's Magnum and you know old Dave said this felt like and we said these have been your words but Dave said this felt like adults were fighting over big issues it was like a reality series where they actually did fight and Dustin told a story he kayfabed the kids on the broken leg and then, because Dustin would have been what? Goddamn, sick, 15, 16 that year, maybe. Dustin saw the cast in the closet with the, the fucking slit up the side where he could, Dusty could put it on and take it off. And he's like, a motherfucker. But that's, you know, that was common in those days in the business. You didn't, because your kids are going to go to school and talk. And then the hard times promo. 
Which has taken on a life of its own because I never heard about that promo until like, whatever, 2004 or yeah. so. And now it's become like the greatest pro. And a lot of people talk about it like it's the greatest promo of all time. It's just no one paid attention to it for 20 years. Well, remember, I've said before in on Wednesdays, promo day at Crockett's office, when the big town would come up and Dusty would be needed, Gene Anderson would go in and get him and he'd walk in from his office where he's working in his book. And okay, boom, count him down, and he'd do a two-minute local promo for Philadelphia that was almost that good, and in one take, and then walk back to his fucking office. It it has taken on a life of its own, and it's a great one. But I kind of, what was it, six, yeah, five or six years, depending on the time of the season. Uh, before that was the payback is hell daddy promo. And I got to be honest, as a fan, even as a photographer, I didn't get to see Dusty in his element in Florida. I saw him in 77 the first time live when he was on Jarrett's first show at the Coliseum. But it was Dusty Rhodes and Tommy Gilbert against Phil Hickerson and Dennis Condry for the Southern Tag Team title. I was smart enough at that point to know that Phil and Dennis were not going to lose the belts because Dusty had never <laughs> was probably not coming back. But it, it, just seeing him come in cold, it was harder to get than when you saw a steady diet of him. And this was before I was able to, finally I could see TBS about that same year also. When my uncle down in East Tennessee, they got cable because they couldn't get real TV stations any other way. And then you started seeing the promos and then you got the whole picture of him. But when tape started going around and you could see the angles, you could see the whole nine yards and the the turn in 80, which I was there for and then got to see the payback is hell, daddy promo. That's when I really started getting done. I said, there's nothing else going on like this. And Ole played his part perfectly, but fucking Dusty. My God, you know. And the way that he built that thing, everybody just go and YouTube it. What would it be under on YouTube? The 1980 Omni Turn? The big turn of 1980, I think, was what it was the last time I looked. Okay. But anyway, um, you know, that's where you can see he's drawing these people in. He's a fucking preacher. He's he's a motivator. He could If he'd have had the desire, he probably could have got elected to politics, especially these days, because you believed him. So anyway, then at that point, you know, then we get into the the part of his life where he's he got two younger kids and you know, now Dustin's wanting to get into business, but Cody's come along and Teal and uh again they showed the footage of uh Dusty beating Flair in Greensboro on the 86 Bash show and that you could see <laughs> heads in the top row of the Coliseum there, that place was jammed that night. I was on the card and I, I found it interesting that the way they phrased it finally, after years of trying dusty beats flair and Cody immediately said all those previous times, those weren't losses. That was the chase. And I'm starting to think now is this what Cody is setting us up for that, you know, yeah, I got beat by Roman the first time. I'll probably get beat by Roman again. Does he think that the chase is going to be his as valuable to him as it was to Dusty before he finally gets that thing? Well, it's not like Cody's responsible for the booking up there. I mean, he can have suggestions, but. What, 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 but what, what if he if he pitched it ahead of time? Yeah, I want you to beat me five times in a row before I win it. You think they're going to turn that down? I, I'm just saying. Maybe that's part of the the idea. Because uh, we'll we'll talk about Raw and Cody's promo later on. But but not everyone can do what Dusty did. Like Dusty was a very special chaser. I guess we could say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Dusty. Uh, I guess you could say Jerry Lawler, Tommy Rich at one point to an extent. But there's the problem with sometimes the chase just ending and then everything kind of changes. But because Cody's such a big part of this documentary, let's tie him into this a little bit. They start the documentary with Cody at WrestleMania hiding because it was a surprise appearance. 
that's how they tie it up at the end of the documentary. Right. Seeing this documentary, what do you think now of the finish at WrestleMania? Well, that's why I brought that up with Cody making a special point of the chase, but also after, which I don't want to jump ahead to the Raw review, but I changed my mind potentially more on the WrestleMania finish because of the promo that Cody did rather than because of this program, but at the same time, it my reaction to the Raw promo that Cody did was almost like, my God, he might be able to pull this off and not lose anybody verbally. We're jumping ahead. When Dusty, obviously, they glossed over the controversy that led to TBS firing Dusty as Booker and then Dusty, because remember, they fired him as the Booker, but he was still there as a talent for a couple of weeks, which is... Very, very difficult, especially to the level that Dusty... It was like, all of a sudden, you know, our our friend Cecil B. DeMille becomes a member of the chorus line. And that wasn't going to work. And, you know, he left shortly thereafter. They glossed over that whole part. And... It, well, can you go it, into that a little bit about the whole... Why he did the spike angle after... He should have seemingly known that would have been a problem. Well, I don't know. Otherwise, the spike than, angle being the road warriors stabbing him in the yes. eye with a spike. Well, and and I, yeah, we will we'll talk about the details, but I don't know that he would have. I don't know that he would have done it if he thought it was going to be that big of a fucking deal. But at the same time, he might have done it because you know what the fuck. It, <laughs> Nobody at TBS was impressing anybody that they knew anything about wrestling, and he wanted to fucking get the goddamn business back up. We had gotten hot, and then Tully and Arn left, and the bottom fell out of that, and then the sale came, and he wanted to heat things up. So the Road Warriors, turning heel by beating up the Midnight Express in unsavory fashion and winning the World Tag Team title and then going on TBS and trying to gouge Dusty's eye out with a spike was supposed to get a lot of heat on the Road Warriors and heat up the next, you know, big program. And what it did was get heat on Dusty with the TBS management, and the people didn't want to boo the Road Warriors. There was a small smattering of booing, but the Warriors were too over at that point. And since I had already bled several pints on <laughs> TBS about a month before that. And they had said, don't have any more blood. Well, Dusty, he didn't get a ton of blood, but it was the idea of the spike in the eye. Cause we were then later on, you remember when flair became the booker and we got the memo about the, don't put the plastic bag over the fucking guy's <laughs> head anymore. Well, that one is a bit more egregious than a spike in the eye, if I say so. I'd rather have a plastic bag over my head than a spike in my fucking eye, fella. I don't know about you, but... Terry Funk tried to murder Ric Flair on TV. <laughs> well, got some fucking heat. Um, we loved it. Uh, you were... But <laughs> you just said something. Were you told that you, the angle with the original Midnight Express, was the specific reason for the no more blood on TV rule? No, but it... it Apparently, it brought it to their attention because I don't think that TBS knew that occasionally there was really blood. Nobody in the new ownership or whatever. I mean, the camera people knew, the director knew, but suddenly it was like, well, they said we can't have blood anymore. Why? Well, I was the last one to bleed. Maybe they just noticed it. And the first that was time also I the first time. On, <laughs> yes, first time I ever bled on television in my life. But God damn it, they remembered it. Anyway, so that was the, and then of course, during the, the, uh, sale process, when TBS was talking to a lot of the top talent, they did talk to the horsemen. We didn't make the cut on the interviews for talking to the top talent, but Tully had pretty much buried Dusty's booking in these supposedly secret confidential talks that they had with the talent. We're not going to say anything, but what do you think? And then Dusty immediately heard everything that Tully had said. And uh, so then Dusty banned Tully off Crockett's plane. Fuck him, he can fly commercial. 
And then that's when between, I guess we were in Houston the night before, went to Philadelphia, Arn and Tully came in. Both of them had had a couple of beverages and announced they were fucking given their notice and they were going to the WWF. And they dropped the belts to us. So that was, and then a couple months later, that shit happened. Uh, but anyway, refresh me now, did Dusty, didn't he go back to Florida and tried to, tried to open up an office in Florida before he did go to work for Vince. He did the PWF and there was some good stuff there. He feuded with Terry Funk before Terry Funk came back to the NWA and well, the, the NWA well, was the NWA, the Still, NWA yeah. in 1989, he returned to Florida to feud with Dusty Rhodes. And then he also did stuff with Dustin. So, I mean, that was one of the first things that put Dustin on the map. It wasn't really Memphis. It was him and Terry Funk in 89. Dusty won the tournament. To be the champion, I think he beat the Big Steel Man, who was his brother-in-law. Yeah, they had the Shockmaster. Na- yeah, they had the Nasty Boys. They had, I think, Scott Hall, Steve Kern. You know, whoever was in Florida with Gordon Soley, Mike Graham, and the biggest star there was, Dusty Rhodes. And, you know, I think the first night, the big show with Dusty did well. And then after that, the problems that were hitting wrestling everywhere hit Florida. Yeah, well, at that point... You needed money, and they had plenty of talent, but they didn't have a huge amount of money nor a strong television. And think about over the previous four years, Eddie Graham had killed himself January of 85. And then by 87, Crockett had taken over. The whole roster had changed and then pretty much ceased to exist, and the Florida town stopped getting run on a regular basis. And then all of a sudden, for... Six months or less, Dusty gets TV at a few places and tries to come, but but it was, you know, it would have taken a massive amount of rebuilding, as I would find out later on in Knoxville. So, and then Gordon Soley went back to the NWA. Funny yeah, enough. and so at that point, Dusty, well, and here was, and the one thing Bruce just chapped my ass on this. He's got to be in there and be the company rah rah guy. Well, see, Dusty and those guys just didn't realize there was a whole world outside of their area that didn't know the Jim Crockett promotions existed. Well, there was a lot of fucking people in Greensboro, Bruce, that wouldn't have come to a fucking WWF house show that year at gunpoint. So uh, things work both ways. But the problem became when Dusty goes to the WWF, he's now in his late 40s. And He's a guy who, as Magnum T.A. said, could depict violence that's not common today. And the WWF didn't sell violence at all. <laughs> they did. It, it, and Dusty had to change. He had to do it differently because Dusty Rhodes, the American dream, the, the thing that they actually admitted, even Dave and a bunch of the boys acknowledged the polka dots was bullshit and rotten and disrespectful, except for Bruce, who gave the same explanation for what he always does. He gave away his mindset where he talked about the differences. Like, you know, you're in these territories and everything seems like a big thing. And then you go to New York and you realize yes. this is really what it is. And that's when all of a sudden he sold his soul and just repeats whatever he thinks yeah. they want to hear. But that was the that was the thing with even if Dusty had come in to the WWF as the American dream with the jeans and the cowboy boots and the whole thing, it was too late for him to start fresh and have that body of work behind him to a different audience. Yes, a lot of more different. And the the same guy that got over in 1970-something in Florida could have got over. And that got over in New York in 1977, could have got over in 1989 if he'd have been the same guy. But he didn't have that body of work behind him and he didn't have the youth to recreate it. He could still talk, but he couldn't do it. And it was a completely different style. You couldn't fucking hang people and cut people's heads off and run into them with cars. Not till the Attitude Era. In, in that period of time in the WWF, he had to dance with poor fucking Sapphire and wear polka dots because it was ice cream bars. Well, if I could say a couple things. One, it would have been nice for Hulk Hogan to speak up. You hear him in this documentary. It's like, 
Yeah, I didn't know why Vince did that. I thought he should have been the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, yeah. and doing well, you should have said that, champ. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, but secondly, they did bring him in like that, kind of. You know, that was my first exposure to Dusty Rhodes. Remember I told you my dad's friend used to talk about seeing him in the garden? This is when it first came up when I was nine years old, first watching WWF wrestling, and Dusty Rhodes was going to fix some woman's toilet. And the next week, he was picking up their garbage. I guess in yeah. Vince's eyes, to be the American dream, you have to do every job that Vince would never want to do. Well, remember, I'm the common man. That was to Vince what being the hero of the working class was. Well, he's got to be a fucking turd pumper or a shit carrier or a fucking ditch digger or whatever. And But Dusty turned it around and threw it back at him and was so fucking over the top with the shit that they had him do and then still knew how to get heat from the people in the live matches that, you know, he made it work for a while. But but they didn't bring him in with the polka. My point was they brought him in his first few appearances, tie-dyed shirt. I think he wore jeans a few times, wore trunks without polka dots. It's like they added that after he was already starting to get over and then they just force that. That's the thing I think a lot of people miss in the story. It wasn't like he came in and they put polka dots on him right away. No, there's a good like month, month and a half. Yeah. No polka dots and it was starting to work. And then polka dots and it worked as well as it could with Sapphire and, and polka said, dots. He needs polka dots. Yeah. Dusty Rhodes and Minnie Mouse. Name anyone else famous with polka dots. <laughs> <laughs> Little Dot. Well, there you go. Anyway, so he was there for what they said about a year and a half and then went back to WCW and that's when he got the uh the booking job there. Was that was that right as Heard was leaving or right after no. Heard had left? No, Heard was still there. The way it worked, and Dusty said it, it was very interesting hearing his own words in this. I was getting a little fed up with the polka dots by the end. Because by the <laughs> end he stopped wearing the polka dots. I don't know if that was yeah. his choice or if they told him he could, but the stuff with him and Dustin there was really interesting and really good and a nice departure from everything else he had done against DiBiase and Virgil. And as a fan, I was disappointed that he finished up at the Royal Rumble because that was it. That was the end of the Dustin and Dusty story in WWF. It went like two months. And he, then he showed up. He was already booking. He first showed up officially in January of 91, but I believe he was already booking they hired him as Booker before he was done with WWF. So he was right. already booking towards the end of 1990, which probably would have been around. No, when he... no, wait, no, no, he wasn't. Because remember, we left in at Halloween 1990 and he wasn't back yet. I think December is when they made the deal with Dusty. And then he finished up January at the Royal Rumble. All right, champ. But then he came back in 91, and Jim Hurd was there in charge for a while longer. Yeah, and then Hurd left, and then that's... Well, actually, Because that's yes, when you met with him, and he tried to get that's you. That's when I met with him, and he said, don't worry, you won't ever have to see Hurd. I, I know I won't, because I'm not coming. But yeah, so you're right. Hurd was still there for a little while. Um, and, you know, again, Dusty had people's loyalty that that he had booked in the past and he had made stars out of and made a lot of money for and if it hadn't been for Jim Hurd still being there and actually even if Hurd had been there I I bought it with Watts because they gave him briefly the alleged top job in the company he was allegedly the final boss and that's why I went back then I would have gone to work for Dusty had Dusty been the, and I even told him that at that Super Brawl pay-per-view. Remember when Watts was already gone at that point, Super Brawl 93. Asheville. And we walked in the locker room, and one of the guys, we'd made a few TV, um, you know, tapings, but I think one of the referees, I can't remember it. I'm not even going to say who it was. But one of them said, hey, good to see you guys back. And I said something like, well, you know, <laughs> look quick because this is the last time you're going to see us. And then about 15 minutes later, Dusty came in and said, can I talk to you, kid? Yes, yes. And we got heat. What are you talking about? Well, I heard you said, tell somebody you weren't going to be back. I said, well, Dusty, I'm not. I said, I, you know, Ole was nominally the new booker, I think, at that point, and Dusty was the vice president of something or other. But I said, 
or maybe it was vice versa. Maybe Dusty was the booker. Then they made Ole the vice president of something. Right? It all was always changing. And I said, Dusty, if it was you, I'd work for you anytime. But it's not you, and nobody's ever going to have that I trust is ever going to have the the pull to be the person that makes decisions, as I've seen from working with Bill Watts here. Suddenly he's gone before we just uh, almost even got started. So, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, I didn't want to work for Dusty. I didn't want to work for TBS and whoever the fuck they were going to put in charge of Dusty. Anyway, but then they went into the, you know, the, the, the stuff that Dustin and Dusty did in WCW briefly, and then talked about the estrangement that, Dusty and Dustin went through, and Dustin became gold dust. And, uh, you know, the issues with Terry is uh, the, and a lot of people knew that the marriage was most of the issues between Dustin and his dad at that point. But finally, they reunited. I thought, and I'm not saying he was against it, but they gave Dusty credit for Ron Simmons becoming the first black WCW champion. Watts was the VP then. Well, Dusty was booking. I mean, that's one of the Dusty things. Dusty was booking. That's why I'm forget. saying he wasn't yeah. against it. But uh, again, <laughs> when the story came out, it was Watts was pushing for it because he wanted to recreate JYD. I th that was that was a group effort. You know, there. the story Watts always told is that when they brought him in in '92. One of the first things they told him to do was fire Dusty, and he didn't want to do that. I mean, he was one of the first people to recognize Dusty's mind, probably. And he brought Dusty in the room, and he said, they want me to fire you. Do you think you're going to have any problem working for me? And Dusty said no, and he didn't get fired. But it's interesting. They didn't think they'd be able to work together or coexist. Dusty would be able to work under a Bill Watts. Well, it, it was the same thing that Watts said later on to Vince when he had that little run up there for a while, and then he quit and went back home. He said, Vince, there's only room for one Titan in Titan sports. And I think Watts knew from his experience running his company how Dusty probably would have felt most any other time, may still have felt then, but wanted the job or whatever, that he'd been the guy for a while. So it was his deal. And who's going to be the Titan in Titan sports? Who's going to be the the top guy of the world in world championship wrestling. So, but then Dusty said, I don't have a problem, Bill, because Watts had predated Dusty in the business. That's one thing Dusty could look up to Watts as having been a booker and owning part of the office when Dusty was breaking in. Watts was the booker when Dusty turned in 74. Yes. And, and plus he, he had worked McGurk's territory with Murdoch in the early 70s. So, you know, at least Dusty could look up to somebody like that. I think if, you'd have, if they'd have brought John Laurinaitis in and said, hey, Dusty, the kid that used to carry the fucking sheep herder's flagpole, is, can you work under him? I'm sure he would have said, yeah, fucking right. It's in my ass, motherfucker. Anyway, so then they they glossed over when WCW... Uh, went under basically and dusty worked a bit he was out of there before him because he worked ecw and he worked the indies that was a several year period that was kind of glossed over in about 30 seconds but it wasn't that newsworthy the point was that they did make the uh, you know make the case that uh, the finances were getting bad and and dusty needed a job and you know at that point i guess he's in his early 60s and what was the quote that he told one of the boys? The boys told me down in Florida, he was sitting there one day in NXT or still when it was FCW or whatever. He said, boy, Vince McMahon better be glad I didn't save my money. Or we, he was, he was having one of those headache days. He was like, I wouldn't be here if I'd have saved my money, but he loved it. He loved the business. And they went to the hall of fame induction and, and him becoming a trainer, teacher, coach, mentor, and then the, the the clip of all three of the Rhodes family together in the WWE in 2013 was that Stephanie was sitting there putting it over. Oh, it was so great. We had this opportunity. Yeah, she's the one who ruined was, it. Yes. Wasn't it her that got pissed at Dusty and took him off TV, cut it off? This was so good. This was the best thing Cody ever did up until, you know, the last few years. They reunite 
Dustin or Gold Dust and Cody with Dusty. And they come out there, and there's one week where it's Dusty with his kids squaring off with Stephanie in the ring. And no, I think he was talking maybe Triple H, but Stephanie's behind him and he puts his hand over her face. Yeah, he she started interrupting while he was on a roll and he put the hand out and like, shh. And the crowd loved it and it was a cool moment. I mean, it stood out and I still remember it. And Stephanie didn't forget it either. She immediately canceled any other times that Dusty would ever talk on TV ever again. <sighs> I mean, that's the way I remember it. I don't know. So, and and Cody did, he said one thing. He said Dusty didn't like being on television at that point. He didn't want people to remember him as a fat old man and kind of choked up at it. He was and, awesome. I, I love that run right there where for a limited period of time, Dusty was involved. It was actually really well, good. Well, but see when they showed the footage. Yes, Dusty, as he aged and got in his 60s and he had never been the body beautiful, he wasn't the most appealing looking guy but he still had the movement and the people still knew and he still knew how to fucking work. And you saw when he hit, it was fucking Plumber Moxley with the bionic elbow and then he's got his belt off and he's kind of twirling it, whipping it at him like he's he's menacing him and the people are out of their seats. It was still fucking dusty. And at that point, I thought, you know what? He was wrestling's Jackie Gleason. The great one. <laughs> he he had an outsized personality. He was athletic, even though his physique defied that to look at him. He did everything. He excelled at everything. Uh, Jackie Gleason was a television star, a movie star, a composer, a comedian. A he did everything. The great one. Well, Dusty was everything and didn't. And they both lost the Harley race. And they both lost to Harley Race. Um, and and Dusty, as a matter of fact, and Dusty always talked about when they ran the Miami Beach Convention Center in Florida that he would go and sneak in and take a shit on Jackie Gleason's toilet in his. <laughs> 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 and but I mean that's he was wrestling's Jackie Gleason. Everything he did, it was broad and it was over the top and it all worked. Well, you heard um, it here, folks. Magnum TA wrestling's Ed Norton. <laughs> Norton, <laughs> how would you? Well, nevertheless. So then, at the end of the program, obviously, and it was it was 2015. It does Dusty never went to the doctor. He was a person that didn't like doctors, and and Michelle said that he thought if he didn't go to the doctor, he wouldn't be sick. And he started losing weight, and I remember. <sighs> I guess about, it wasn't, a, but a few months before he died, I, Magnum talked about in this program seeing Dusty a, a, so much lighter, like 70 pounds lighter than he, you know, than he knew him as. And I had been talking on the phone to J.J. Dillon. And J.J., I guess, was at the same show because he had said, wow, Dusty, I hope he's feeling okay he was significantly lighter and at the time i had said well maybe you know because he's almost 70 now or if he's not over 70 whatever he was i said he's always been overweight maybe he's doing that now preemptively to you know to be in better health we can think about that obviously that was not what he was doing and i still had never really heard all the details that Michelle and, and the rest of the family gave him this, but he collapsed at home. He went to the hospital. They found out he had a liver infection. And 30 hours after she called the ambulance, he was gone. I didn't know that that took place that, that quickly, that suddenly. But And it was really heartbreaking hearing his oldest daughter, who uh, I thought was great throughout this documentary, talking about, you know, she was on the way there. She just missed... Yeah, and he sat up and had that last moment with Cody and Dustin. But uh, the family really were the stars of this, I think. They all did a great job. Yeah. And that's why I, said, I think it was the best one they've done overall, because it was a guy from the, you didn't, it was footage that you didn't, haven't seen done to death over and over. If you've seen it at all, you're as old as me and, and or a tape collector like Brian. 
and just what a personality. And that's the way you used to be able to get in the wrestling business and and be the biggest star and get involved in the office and blah, blah, blah. You could work your way up and you could make yourself that level of attraction and it's not possible anymore. And But nobody's got that personality anyway. And, and I know people... And again, there's reason for knocking some of Dusty's booking when he got he got too comfortable or he didn't he wasn't a detail guy and you know it was all about the big stuff. Yes, he he had weak spots in things that you look back and say, well, he shouldn't have done that. He was too confident and everything or whatever, but who else ever no wrestling company against Vince McMahon ever until the late 90s during WCW's accidental fucking, you know, challenge period ever was really neck and neck in any way with Vince McMahon and no wrestling company until that late 90s attitude era besides the WWF ever grossed the money that Crockett Promotions did in 1986. So if he wasn't, you know, the the absolute best, he outperformed the other guys that were better. What do you think of his brother saying that he never heard anyone in the family ever call him Virgil? Well, we everybody's known that a long. Nobody ever called him Virgil. I thought at least the family, you think, that I didn't realize even the brother said that I've never heard him called Virgil by anyone. I never heard well of his kids and or you know any close friend I was ever around in his presence or anybody. I've never heard anybody call him Virgil. And the only reason that it was a rib when they had credits on the TBS program that they would roll at the end, and he put his name up as producer Virgil Runnels Jr. Because only the smart fans then who were microscopic, you know, part of the overall audience knew what Dusty Rhodes' name really was. And then when Ted DiBiase shows up with a servant, Vince McMahon, because it was never a rib, decides to name the servant Virgil. Yes. After his prime it was never. It was never a rib. <laughs> And then they did, again, some incredible highlights to close the thing, and it ended with Cody's return at WrestleMania and Dustin in his wrestling school and the families together, and I thought that was that was nice. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, I owe Dusty a ton for what he did for me and for the Midnight, and a lot of people do, because he didn't have to, he didn't have to push us like he did. He gave us a tremendous fucking push at the start of our run and through the whole thing with the rock and roll. And yes, he got tremendous returns out of it, but he worked with us when, when Dennis left, he figured the Midnight Express and Cornette's a valuable commodity. We're going to let him pick a, have a replacement. And he, we were his go-to guys when he, needed somebody to do something he knew we could get it done he'd stick us in it and we were nothing but successful with dusty well there it is the a and e biography of the american dream dusty Rhodes. definitely one worth going out of your way to see a great job they did it could have been twice as long and i would have been intrigued by it like we're talking about all these yeah. different things they left out what a great story well jim transitioning from the dusty Rhodes biography to more wrestling talk. We're going to talk about WWE Raw in a moment. And that really isn't a happy thought, going from memories of the era of the American dream to whatever it is that is happening on Monday nights. From the, from the, the American dream to the current television viewer's nightmare. Well, perhaps it's your nightmare, or perhaps you have actual issues or problems that you need someone to talk with about. And when you're done butchering the English <laughs> language, Jim will tell you exactly where you can go. Yes, great transition. If you have nightmares and wake up <laughs> screaming and having the sheets soaked with sweat, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps you need somebody to talk to and share some of this. Um, 
And now that we've made enough light of that, especially with how we started the program today, mental health is a serious issue, not only in, in this country, but around the world, but especially in the United States because of contributory factors. And it doesn't seem like that a lot of people are paying attention to trying to better access to, for people that need it to mental health services. And you'll get to run around in a lot of cases if you try to find anybody locally or in person or in your area or if the insurance covers it or don't because we all know about the insurance situation in the United States. Nevertheless, if you need someone to talk to, if you've been thinking of trying therapy but you can't for whatever reason find someone in your area or someone that fits or someone that you can afford, we encourage you to give BetterHelp a try. Obviously, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp, as are many of our programs. And we have done that because so many of the Cult of Cornet listeners have given us feedback that they were able to help themselves with the process. BetterHelp is a, a online therapy situation where you don't need to go anywhere in person. You don't need to talk to anybody in person. You can go online. You take a slight quiz and you find out who might be a good matchup for you. They have licensed therapists that you can change at any point until you find one you like. But it's, as I said, entirely online and designed to be convenient and flexible, and you can work it around your schedule. So, as we mentioned, all you got to do is go to Better Help. H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com, slash J-C-E, fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a therapist, and you'll get 10% off your first month's services by going to betterhelp.com slash J-C-E, 10% off your first month's services. So if you've been thinking of giving therapy a try, this would be a way to dip your toe in the water and potentially run some things by someone else that's affecting your decision-making process. And you get the 10% off, so you can't beat that with a stick. You know what they say, Brian? It's like a sore dick or a busted drum. You can't beat it. No one says that. Nobody? Did Mama Cornette ever say that? She actually never used to say that. No one else says that either. Well, then forget I said it. Maybe you could use someone to talk to. Better help! Dot com slash J-C-E. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on with the show here, Jim. Last night, WWE Raw was on TV, as it is every yeah. Monday for the last 30-something yeah. years, and there isn't a sponsor or a website or a service for booking help, but well, maybe there could be. Well, you know, I've got a couple of emails, Brian, that were forwarded to me from out there in the cult of Cornette from Derek very quickly who was at Raw in Seattle. He says, it's been 90 minutes since the start. There have been not one, not two, not three, but four WWE Universe cameras to the audience to do DX impressions and stupid faces. I should have known better, but I don't think I can sit through this live. It's much better with Fast Forward. That's from Derek and Brandon. <laughs> from the <laughs> Northwest wrote, Hello, Jim and Brian. I want to confirm something you've been talking about on the podcast. My family and I recently went to Monday Night Raw here in Seattle. Well, that was last night, so I guess, yeah, it was recent. You were talking about wrestlers rolling out of the ring and disappearing. Well, at this Raw show, it happened twice. Liv Morgan got kicked off the apron and must have sat frozen in the same position for several minutes. Fans were yelling at her to just get the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Otis did this as well and then when it gets close to the tag they spring up as if they just did some cocaine and make the tag <laughs> it makes no sense and it looks even worse live on top of that was the format somebody like Bobby Lashley comes out does his entrance his music stops and then he just stands in the ring watching commercials until his opponent comes out and it just drags the show wait they show the commercials in the building 
Apparently. And Bobby Lashley watches the commercials with the fans. <laughs> I could tell it wasn't just myself. Everyone is sitting on their hands. I even saw someone trying to sleep and another person reading a book. I was embarrassed to be a wrestling fan. And the more annoying thing is WWE thinks they're doing something right. That's what Brandon says. So th again, it, it, it think of how many years wrestling TV shows were not only exciting to the viewer, but the live audience was there going ballistic. It doesn't have to, be, it doesn't have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. And a lot of people don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. Keep your stories coming in, by the way. We've been getting so many people who actually attend these live events to let us know what it's really like, for good or for bad. Sometimes they correct us on things, but I like hearing these first-hand reports. Keep sending them in. Well, speaking of a first-hand report, <laughs> Raw of April 10th. Now, I know they had travel issues because Seattle is as far as you can go in this country without hitting water in any direction, right? And they had some rewrites. But now that I've seen, if you've read the writs he's written, you'll know they're really well-written writs. I've seen the people who were either delayed or did not arrive, and it amounted to four or five people, and Sammy and fucking Riddle got there at the end. So, yes, the show was rewritten from what they originally intended, but I don't see how they could have gone from this to something acceptable with just another four or five people. Do you? Well, again, this is a company and a show where they're very used to, especially last week, rewrites until the last second. So that shouldn't have rattled anyone. Are there times that you've experienced this where all of a sudden, I'm, well, you haven't really dealt with live TV, just TV tapings, but live TV where... Well, no, I, I was a lot of live Raws. Oh, that's true. We were doing Raw live. There, yeah. I was actually thinking about the stuff you booked and promoted yourself. Oh, okay. But the idea of real-life travel issues, not the whole, you know, Bruno San Martino's not here, and then he shows up with his suitcase and he beats everyone up with it, which is kind of what they ended up doing here at the end. Yeah. But how do you deal with that as a booker? All of a sudden, in Memphis, you probably saw that plenty of times. Oh, yeah. Well, and I mean, it's happened to me on live events. Uh, every once in a while, somebody that you plan to be at a TV taping you know, wouldn't be there. Most of the time, it didn't happen to be in Smoky Mountain because all the guys were in the territory. We didn't we didn't fly Terry Funk in and have him work TV, send interviews in and work the house show, right? It's happened in OVW, when, especially when we had WWE talent supposed to come in and a few times planes would, you know, get sideways or whatever. And a lot of the programs I was doing was live to tape to begin with, so you got to treat it like live. But you have to do the best you can. But then again, I've never had a three hour program to completely revamp when there was as little going on. Cause I mean, everything in this is either in, in every week's raw is either a 30 minute fucking segment that's drawn out amongst the same participants, promo and entrances and match and afterbirth, or it's just a get in and get out thing anyway, but it's, yeah, but they have again, <laughs> Like, if you didn't tell me that there were travel issues, I wouldn't have even known from watching it. It was just like every other Raw. Yeah, no, it, it wasn't remarkably different. I mean, they did a, the, the existing Knoxville television show of the John Kazana promotion era that ended in 1974 is from a, a December 1972 program, and they never saved the shows, but I think the reason why this one got saved back and later on became in a position a position became into possession of Kazana's family was because it was one of those studio TVs from hell that you remember from the territory days where back then you had a 1 hour show and you wouldn't have 40 wrestlers show up for television you might have 12 or 14 counting the referee and then they had bad weather <laughs> and snow and ice up in the mountains and nobody could get there to the studio. So they ended up, it was, the entire program was Jerry Lawler and Jim White with their manager, Sam Bass, against Tommy Gilbert, who was the only baby face. So they had Jim White versus Tommy Gilbert and a disputed finish that led to Lawler versus Tommy Gilbert. And then they did an angle at the end. 
And it around all that was Ron Wright cutting promos and doing an angle with Devoy Brunson, who was one of the referees. And they made an hour TV show out of that. And so, yes, things have always happened, but in this case, they have not dozens and dozens, they have hundreds of talents under contract. And I can't believe that they didn't have a few of, you know, just headed to Seattle as standby just in case. But it, nevertheless. What do you think would be tougher to do, though? You kind of said it before in an interesting way. Do you think it would be harder to, at the last minute, rewrite a three hour TV show that's going out that night or a four hour or three hour TV taping with four episodes with the person who's not there figured in? Well, probably, unless it was your main event guy and you were doing four weeks of TV to build a goddamn big show, probably rewriting the four weeks of, of television on tape. But then, well, but then there's a lot of details that a change in hour one will affect two, three, and four, and you've got to go through and prove free. It's, it's a nightmare either way. That taping I went to in Smoky Man in 94, right after the Thrill Seekers got hurt, right after you had Chris <laughs> Walker no-show. That must have been hell. It was uh it was not the most fun we ever had. But you know, again having said that, let, let's let's look through this thing because there was a couple of good things and then there's more of just eh. Rey Mysterio comes out to the ring for a live promo. The people love him. Nothing matter with that. He was talking about his ups and downs. He's had gone from the Hall of Fame to fighting his son. And suddenly, Dominic music. And here comes Dominic out with the mic, and he's got a lot of heat. But now we go through what I said a week or two ago, the 10 minutes of WWE-style dramatic back-and-forth emoting. And... You can love the talent, but it goes on so long and follows the same pattern every week. And now they've added the wrinkle that the talent pitches to their own VTRs in the middle of the promo. So then, live, folks, answer us. <laughs> Do the opponents that are mad at each other, like the son that's betrayed his father, when the son pitches to, well, let's watch what happened. Do they just turn around and stand there for three minutes? Watching the screen with everybody else? I know this, is, that this isn't a big victory, but I think that's better than that just happening with no introduction, which it seems like happens a lot on these shows. But that's the problem, too, is that there's a way you can build this and format this. VTRs from last week are crucial to the wrestling show to bring people up to date on the story. If they didn't see the show last week, you get you hit them again. But that's why you come to the desk. Ladies and gentlemen, it was just seven days ago that Dominic Mysterio pulled out a speckled dildo and fucking hit Rey Mysterio over the head with it. Let's take a look at what happened, that shocking moment. And you go to the VTR and you come back and you've hit Rey Mysterio's music. And as he's coming to the ring, you have the chance for the announcers to recap. Well, that was last week and we know that Ray Mysterio must be so upset that he's got those 14 stitches in his head from that pink and purple dildo. And then Ray starts his promo, and then Dominic's music interrupts at such point, because they got to do that all the time. And we're up on all this stuff, and then here comes Dominic saying some more shit, but it takes for fucking ever. And they're not really mad. And if they're pitching to VTRs now, we might as well have the guys pitch to their own break. Because the announcers don't. <laughs> that would be good. And we'll be right back well, after this. It? Yes, if the guy did his promo and said, and I challenge you for backlash, if you've got any guts, you'll accept. Folks, don't go away. We'll be right back. What? When Dominic first came out, he caught himself. He said, keep your name out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those tenses and adjectives and adverbs and past plural participles and the things that dangle and all that stuff. What do you think of what Ray was actually saying, though? The idea that he didn't want to fight his son. No father wants to do that. But now at this point, he realizes his son is lost. And now he has no problem kicking the shit out of him. Well, yes, and that's great, except that it's the same pattern every week. He said, I didn't want to fight you at WrestleMania, but now the, the cause is lost, so I might as well fight you right here tonight in Seattle. 
and get the pop. But then Dominic, as the heel like they do every week, says, oh, no, 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 these people don't deserve it. But I know somebody that will fight you, and he brings out Finn Balor, of course. And now we're going to have Finn versus Ray. We've already been out there with these people 15 minutes, and they're just getting started. That's what I, it's, there's no urgency and it's just, it's long and it's the same people interacting. A lot of people forget that in the territory days, when these programs, whether it be Briscoe and Funk or Lawler and Valiant or Rhodes and fucking Pac Song, whoever the fuck it was. Yes, they went week after week in the arena, but when you watch TV, they were talking about each other. They were fighting other people and beating them convincingly. and occasionally. They interacted for a couple minutes and whacked each other over the head with shit. You didn't get to see them standing in the same place having back and forth conversations for 10, 15, 20 minutes. You know, the, so, uh, the other thing so, too is we're coming off a period where WWE has felt happening. People have been curious about a lot of different things. We're a week after WrestleMania. Okay, there's a lot of people who weren't there who were supposed to be there. Start the show with Cody arriving or something to go right in. Nothing against Rey Mysterio, but the top thing is Cody Rhodes or Sammy and Kevin versus the bloodline and the bloodline drama. And it would play out on this show. But I'm a big believer. Start the show with something showing that someone from that camp is there and something may happen. At the start of the program, the footage of Brock Lesnar destroying Cody and then Cody pulling up. And say Cody Rhodes, and I know they've been uh, advertised these things, but you're talking about actually visually portraying it. Cody Rhodes will answer what Brock Lesnar has done tonight on the program, blah, blah, blah. But instead, we get the first 30 minutes is all about it's more of the Ray and the Judgment Day. Yeah. And Finn and Ray, and they got four minutes before they did a dive to the break. And when they came back, they got another five or six minutes, and... Imagine this, Dominic gets a chain and tries to swing at Ray, and Ray blocks it and nails him, gets a big pop, and then Ray hits a dive on both the heels, rolls Finn Balor in the ring, <laughs> and then Dominic takes the same chain that he just had a minute ago and nails Ray with it, and Finn Balor hits the foot stomp, one, two, three. So they're, they take forever to get there, but it's the classic no originality we've seen it a million times cheap heel finishes behind the referee's back that ends it without they take you on a ride for the last 30 or 45 seconds but before that it's just been match and that's why i'm liking the way cody's are put together at least cody is keeping people going up and down but they followed that did i miss anything in that analysis no i don't think so well, they followed that with the comedy of the model girl and Shush and Otis Campbell and girls were screaming in the back because Lita was jumped by unknown assailants and Adam Pierce screamed for the doctor and half a dozen girls were shrieking at the top of their lungs about what happened. And then we got the Cody and Brock package. This is now a few attacks that have happened backstage where right at a camera shot, and we didn't exactly capture the person who did it or a person who ran away, but we're there to see the after effects. I'm, I'm suspecting Pierce at this point. He was there very quickly. He was there. He's always on the spot very quickly. I think Pierce is jealous that he's not allowed to wrestle because he's probably a better worker than half the people on this, this roster these days. Certainly Lita. Oh, boy. We'll get to that. Um... But then after the Cody and Brock package, Becky was so upset in her backstage interview that Lita was in a local medical facility. Ding, ding, ding. I wish I had a bell right now. Ding, ding, ding. He's back. He's back, ladies and gentlemen. Wait a minute. Do I have a... <laughs> Hold on. I thought I Where's had the a... ratings? I got sorry, a bell. There's a whistle. No, don't do Wait that around Vince. Hey, there, there's a bell. Close enough. Close enough. So Becky was so upset about that that she refused, would not look at the camera that was two feet in front of her face, was looking down at her feet, was looking off, was looking everywhere. 
And then Trish came in and offered to be her partner so that she could defend the title tonight against the uh, imposing team of Raquel Rodriguez and Liv Morgan. So let's talk about this for one second, just in terms of general wrestling rules throughout time. The idea of another person coming and just saying, hey, I'll be the partner in the tag team championship team and we could defend the titles. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it would have been nice if it had been validated by a uh, official from the promotion. <laughs> Say, okay, <laughs> we're going to allow that. But hey, since they can pitch to their own breaks and make their own matches and make their own stipulations, I guess now they can just do that too. But yes, it's an old wrestling cliche, as you will, that someone would volunteer to take the place of an injured person in such a situation to try to, you know, defend the belts or do this or that, only if it's approved by the promotion. And the promotion would not approve it unless the heel had done something to the original participant, in which case they were saying, okay, you get a taste of your own medicine. We're going to, we're going to approve this with so-and-so can take his place and blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, if that doesn't happen, then the baby face has to defend on their own. You know, if, if they, if it's a forfeit or and lose it situation or forfeit or fight is what I'm trying to say, but they just kind of come in. Okay, well, I'll do it. Oh, okay. Well, that'll be fine. But nobody's taking this seriously anyway, and you can tell, and that's why they're not going to be doing biographies about this era of wrestling. <sighs> but now we got Trish and Becky, and they go right out to the ring against Raquel and Liv. I liked Raquel before they made her this smiley, happy, blah person. Remember when she was badass and dressed in leather and looked intimidating and was fucking never smiled and was powering people around. Now she's the happiest girl in the whole USA and Donna Fargo would be jealous. I'm the happiest girl in the whole USA. I can't tell. Is that your real singing voice? Or are you trying to sound like a woman? Well, I was trying to sound like Donna Fargo. No relation to Jackie, Don, and Roughhouse, but she had a hit. And old Liv Morgan looked like she was just pixie-ish and ecstatic as also as well. So they had what was termed by the announcers as a match. I didn't want to watch this. I skipped ahead of the first three minutes. They went to the break. But when they came back, they were a couple minutes from 9 o'clock. And I'm like, well, this is there's something going to happen here or just this random girls match would not be presented at the top of the nine o'clock hour. And I dipped in to view it and saw some of the most awkward fucking bullshit going on that I've ever seen in my life. It's like every woman in this match took an amnesia pill and forgot how to work. And I started zipping a little ahead to see if I'd, if they'd finally get it. They didn't finish this till my God, almost 10 after nine. I mean, at one point, Raquel and Liv did some double team shit to Becky. It was, it was so awkward. I don't think they could figure it out. And then the, the baby faces took over and got lost and they went for a double superplex on Liv and took 30 seconds to realize her legs were inside the ropes. And then as they were struggling, Raquel came over and power bombed all of them. And it wouldn't end, and it was 100 miles an hour, and either they were missing what they were trying to do or doing it sloppy. And then finally, Trish went for her kick, and Liv Morgan just schoolgirled her, one, two, three. Boom, new champions. I mean, the fans were not just silent. It was like a library for some of this. They, they popped for the title change, but did you pay close attention to any of this? I did in the background, and then I started watching closer and closer. It was sloppy. I mean, I think there's a problem. I'm not pointing the fingers at anyone here, but it turned out in this match, but you see it amongst a lot of the women in wrestling. They don't know how to work. They know how to do spots. They know how to do sequences, 
They know how to go over something in the back and try to do it in the ring. But to actually like have a moment where the crowd's not reacting to anything, I'm kind of lost a little bit in the ring. No one just, again, kick someone in the gut, take them by the hair, slam them in the rope. Slam them in the turnbuckle and just choke them. Just do something else. So you're saying they're good at replication, but not inspiration. I felt that a little bit in this match. The crowd was silent, but again, you don't know how much of that is the fault of the women versus the fault of the format or anything else. I'm into Rhea Ripley. I'm into the stuff with her and Charlotte Flair, and I'm into Bianca Belair. I like Asuka, but I didn't really... I'm not... I haven't been digging anything with Becky since she turned back babyface, and everything with the man now feels forced. I don't buy her promos anymore either. And I didn't like the thing with her and Lita getting back together, and now they're going to do her and, I guess, her against Trish. That could well, be interesting. Me, remember what I said a while back was, I said, what female big names can they get back that Vince is going to demand come back? To all hands on deck, the sale and the ratings and the TV rights negotiation well he talked lita and trish because they were the two names we could kind of think of and that's where it gets interesting because they're the two biggest women stars from the period in between you know the fabulous moolah era the people who are at least started during her era and the era afterwards where we have the rhea ripley's and a bianca Belair, as it really started with the sasha banks and the charlotte flares and Becky Lynch and Bailey and all of them, there's a period in between where, you know, it'll be interesting because they're both older than they were then, how that style of work that Trish and Lita, you know, their style of work from that period of time 20 years ago, how's that going to work in a match now? It'll be really interesting to see how it works for Trish as a heel. Well, I guess we should say then that the afterbirth on this thing was the because the, they were all baby faces nominally Raquel and Liv celebrate and take off and Becky comes in kind of half-heartedly raises Trish's hand and gives her kind of a blah hug like well it's okay it's not your fault and it felt awkward and like it was taking too long already so you knew something was about to happen and you could see it because they were lingering on it and you could see it coming a mile away and then Becky turns to walk out of the ring and Trish runs up behind her and hits a shitty forearm it wasn't like a spinner around clothesline or whatever. It's like, boom, and, and Becky's got to sell it. And then she turns around and KOs her with the, the kick and left. I mean, we're used to seeing people be rendered limb from limb and, and ready for the goddamn wood chipper. And she got a forearm from behind and a kick and she left. And that was the 9 o'clock, actually the 9.12 or so p.m. Eastern Angle. I'm not sure that, that this <laughs> is going to be names against each other is what they're going to be. You think Vince would call Sable? Oh, good Lord. I'm sure, actually, if Vince has thought of it, I'm sure Brock has shot it down. And besides, think of, my God, she had enough wrinkles 20 years ago. She's been away so long now. They'd have to pay for the facelift, and then they'd have enough left over to make a midget. <laughs> She'd have nipples on her chin. All right, will you stop it? It's an older demographic anyway that watches these shows. Maybe... Well, boy, you talking... Yeah, older demographic. <laughs> How about a day older than dust? <laughs> All right, can you imagine... Why? <laughs> they gave her a facelift... For fuck's sake, it'd be so tight, she'd be talking about this if she was talking at all. Maybe that's why Vince is talking like that. What do you, and, and but did you see that somebody now has said that Vince looks like a guy that's ready to challenge someone to an around the world balloon race? <laughs> hey, did you see John Oliver this week make fun of Oh, Vince? yes, 30 seconds on Vince's look. <laughs> Even he couldn't resist. And he put up the side-by-side. -side. He's looked like this for 75 years, and now he looks like this. Yes. And no, he actually said he's looked like a normal human being for the last 30 years, and now <laughs> he looks like this. You know, another uh, thing I see a few people have sent to me, we talked about the mustache and the look. You know, Ted Turner had a thin mustache. <laughs> 
Maybe this is but, Vince's way of saying I could do this better than you and grow it. But darker. he let himself go gray and and wore it proudly. Turner did. Uh, so Paul E was in the back and still refuses to answer the question of did he know why Brock did what he did or why did Brock do what he did or who do the voodoo did you do so well? And instead he talked about. Solo and Kevin Owens tonight. So now we know the main events, Kevin Owens against Solo. So now it's every week it's going to be Owens versus Solo or Zayn versus Solo or Owens and Zayn versus Zola, whatever. But Paul's wrinkle is Sammy and Riddle aren't there. Flight delays. Actually, maybe they got, they, they just realized the situation they were in and they took later flights. And he made the point that Owens has no friends here tonight. Well, that's not unusual. I'm, I'm, I just joshed the big fat fellow. No friends tonight. Sammy's not here. Riddle's not here. But we are. The Usos are. I am. Solo is. And we're going to solve the problem tonight. And he did another great backstage promo. His interaction with the two different women, Kathy Kelly on Raw, and I'm forgetting the other uh, girl's name on SmackDown. She does a good job. Renee Moxley Good. No, it's not Renee Moxley Good. Oh, what's the name? The one who looks like Becky G. I forget what her name is. His interaction with them individually is very good every time. Like a lot of people just come out there. Okay, I'll walk in the camera frame now. Yeah. I'll say my speech. Thank you. His interplay with them, sometimes just a look, and their look in return, they do a good job too. That's what makes me think they do a good job is just the fact that they could do this with Heyman because they don't get a chance to do it with anyone else. Well, and that's the thing is it, 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 he's treating everyone differently rather than just walking up and it could be your Aunt Bertha or the local newscaster holding a microphone. I, I like that. But it's the little things, little things. Yeah, little things like the chin hair he has. You have me focusing on that every time he's on TV now. <laughs> All right. Well, the match that I actually was going to watch and did watch, and I'm sorry I did watch, was Bobby Lashley versus Bronson Reed. Oof. because, okay, we've said before, Bronson Reed's got a lot of potential. and He's like a young, second coming, a crusher Blackwell type, where he's got that shape, but he can move it around. And boy, if he just had some oomph to him, or maybe a manager to make him a monster heel, or just some the last piece of the puzzle, right? And Lashley is, I don't know what they're fucking doing. Are they going to reform the Hurt Business? Put him back with MVP. He's been... He's been a baby face and a heel. He's been back and forth. He, he, he's alone or he's with someone else or it just, he's floating and twisting in the wind and you can see it on his face that he's not into what the fuck's going on. I mean, that don't mean he's not trying. I mean, he can't get into it. It's just there. And, but this was a different match. We haven't seen this before. And it was an hour and 25 minutes into the show. We've had a rotten girls tag team match and Finn versus Ray. I thought, okay, let's see what they do here. How are they going to work this? They started a hundred miles an hour with a bunch of punches and an awkward back and forth, which for these two was not a good choice to start fast and sloppy. And... Uh, Bobby went for a suplex and Bronson Reed reversed it, tried to hang him stomach first over the top rope, but kind of really just set him on the apron. And they had an ugly forearm back and forth. And they, they just started throwing and didn't stop and looked like two drunks in quicksand. And the, the break after three minutes was a thank God kind of thing. I'm thinking maybe they will settle down, calm down, grab something, get this back in order. They come back, Bronson Reed is still in control, and they went to a picture after the commercial break. They come back, and you see the match going, and they go to a picture-in-picture picture of a movie plug for like 30 seconds or a minute. And then Bronson Reed is throwing dozens of obviously phony punches in the corner. And he misses a splash, and Bobby kind of makes a comeback and hits a snap suplex, whereas before he couldn't get the, the big suplex. And then he went for the hurt lock, but he couldn't lock his hands because Reed's shoulder and upper shoulders, upper body, arms, whole nine yards are too big. And he, it looked like he tried to pick him up in the 
in the full Nelson, even though he didn't have it locked, and Bronson Reed just fell right backwards flat on Lashley. And then the announcer said, oh, I've never seen that before. Reed just fell backwards on Lashley on purpose. I don't know that it was on purpose. And then <laughs> Bronson Reed at one point hit what they called kind of a Thez press off the top rope, but it looked just like Vader's Vader splash in the corner off the second rope. Boom, a, a body check. And they went back and forth some more, and Bobby hit a spine buster and goes for the hurt lock again, but can't get it, but they roll through the ropes, and they get in an ugly fight on the floor, and it was a double count out. And then the only part of it that was really good, there was more ugly fight, but they sent out a bunch of referees and agents, and finally the fans got into it when it was just mayhem on the floor, and then they cut out of that before it was resolved. This, it you can't say it was a style clash, because it, even if they had executed this well, it wasn't the right match to have. I don't know who the agent was. I don't know who set this up for them. I don't know what input they had. But this was not good at all. What were your thoughts before I give mine on how it could be better? Well, I'm not going to add too much to what you said. I did not like this whatsoever. And uh, I like Bronson Reed when we saw him in NXT. He hasn't really done anything to stand out since he's been on the main roster. And Lashley is just lost at sea without the Hurt Business. Yep. And they could have started so much differently and they could have built to something. And I believe the people would have gotten into it. But when they started off with just trying to make the mistake of giving them action right off the bat, then they were doomed from the start. Bronson Reed is newer and less established than Bobby Lashley. So even though they're both powerhouses, establish Bronson Reed as a threat. The bell rings. They're wrestlers. They can lock up and bull each other around like they did as big men. Instead of throwing dozens of punches at each other that nobody's going down for, Bobby Lashley, grab a fucking headlock. Bronson Reed immediately back him into the ropes and shoot him off. Lashley hits the fucking tackle and fucking Bronson Reed stands his ground and Lashley ends up on his fucking ass. What the, and looks up, what the fuck? And gets back up. And now before I say this, if I was the producer or the agent of the match, we know that Bronson Reed can do a lot of athletic things that belie his size. I don't know if, what I'm going to say he, he can do, but I would ask him, I would say, can you, can you leapfrog? You can drop down. Can you drop kick like Crusher Blackwell used to? You can do the deal where you go fucking shoulder through into the post, can't you? I would get an idea of the things that Reed could do convincing. We've seen the big splash off the top. And I remember he's got a great big elbow, leaping elbow drop, right? So first time headlock, shoot him off, bam. Lashley loses the fucking tackle war. He's on his ass. Bronson Reed has not been moved. Lashley jumps up. Hits the ropes on the other side. Another tackle. Reed doesn't move, but Lashley doesn't go down. Then Lashley hits the ropes again. This time, if he's able, Bronson Reed leapfrogs. If not, Bronson Reed drops down. And as he comes off the other side, can Bronson Reed drop kick? If he can, I would have had him drop kick. If not, I'd have had him hit that big fucking vader thing like he did off the buckle at lash and lashley takes a bump and rolls out on the floor and now the announcers are going my god look at, the, at lashley we've never seen him be handled like this but he was actually being handled the announcers were saying that but in the ring it was just two fucking drunken elephants rolling around wallering on each other then lashley comes slides back in Lock up again. He goes behind, goes for the fucking full Nelson. The hurt lock. But there you see he can't lock, lock his hands. And you see Bronson Reed laugh and break the grip and Lashley shocked again. And then Lashley says, fuck it. 
and he grabs a, and then he maybe fucking blows into him with a shot, a shot, backs him up, shoots Bronson Reed off, goes for a clothesline, Bronson Reed ducks it, comes off the other side with a fucking spear or a flying tackle and knocks Lashley through the ropes to the floor, and there's your break spot. His hurt lock has been foiled. He's been knocked down several times. He can't take Reed off his feet. Now he's in jeopardy. What this new superstar on the scene? We'll be right back. Come back now in the middle of the match. You give Lashley a flurry now that you've established that the newer, younger, lesser known heel is a threat. Now, goddamn, maybe Lashley fucking is in the corner and Bronson Reed tries to shoot him corner to corner. But fucking Lashley fucking reverses it, shoots Reed into the corner. He moves the goddamn ring. Lashley fucking makes a charge, but Reed moves out of the way. Lashley hits the buckle, turns around. Reed picks him up at a scoop slam. Boom. Goes for that big leaping elbow, but Lashley moves out of the way. Bam. Reed lands. Lashley comes up as Reed turns into him. Lashley goes for a fucking slam. Oh, but his back gives out. And Lashley puts him back down and he drops down. Now, Reed gets some more fucking heat. He turnbuckles him into the back, into the turnbuckles back first. And a second time. And he goes for a third time. But Lashley reverses the whip and shoots Reed through the fucking ropes, shoulder first into the fucking ring post, and then collapses selling his back. Now both of them are down. But Reed comes back in and plants Lashley with another slam. And an elbow drop to the fucking back that Lashley's been selling. And now he goes up to the top, and he's going to put him away. But as he goes off the top for a fucking splash, goddamn Lashley moves out of the way. Now both of them are selling, but Lashley's coming up. And now Lashley rocks the guy with clothesline rock, clothesline rock, clothesline rock. He's wobbling. He's staggered. And then he spins right into a goddamn full scoop slam by Bobby Lashley. And that's where he proves he can slam him. But his back at the same time goes out again. Now they're both selling. And as Reed comes up and goes to do something, Lashley tries one more time to put the hurt lock on. And that's where they roll through the ropes and do their cheap double count out. What do you think about that one instead of what you saw? Sounds a lot better than what I saw. What I saw was terrible. Because they were just out there just throwing punches and kicks at each other and just doing shit back and forth to each other. They were not telling any story about who's going to be able to pick the other one up, who's going to be able to put the finishing hold on the other one, who's going to be the one whose back gives out for whatever. You got multiple things going on in that exchange. It's all shit they can do. And if they'd have done it in that order, everybody would come out looking a little bit better than what they fucking did. <sighs> Should we move on? Raw rolls on. Raw rolls on. Cody! 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 He comes out the in-ring promo. The people are up for him. And I'm going to paraphrase a bit of... I'm going to describe kind of what he talked about. But I can't even begin to do this promo i thought if if you watched the dusty biography did you hear a dusty promo here just using bigger words maybe to an extent i mean it was i think an attempt to maybe sound like that a little bit i will i he admitted that he lost at wrestlemania and took the blame and was smart to do so because a baby face that owns up to his mistake and didn't not calculating how far Roman Reigns and the bloodline would go. He even said, I'm sorry to the fans apologized for not winning. So they've got to be the ones to go. Oh, no, Cody, it wasn't your fault. We're not mad at you. Even if they really were mad at him, thought it was their, his fault. Now that it's, he's turned them around. And he <laughs> admitting that the baby face admitting he lost and telling the people that he feels like he let them down is the classic way to get out of losing and letting the people down. And then he said the only people who say wins and losses don't matter are the, the people who have finished their story. Well, I have not. And 
when Paulie said that for another title shot, Cody has to earn it, then he built the thing up and he said, earn it, I am it. And the people were cheering in the right places. And I wrote at that point, he may be pulling this off in terms of cutting a promo to keep people's interest in what he's doing and, and their belief in the fact that, or the their belief that he can do it eventually, even after this letdown. And that's why I'm, I'm thinking the, 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 the emphasis that Cody put on Dusty in the biography episode, the chase, the chase. He may be pulling this off, and he went into what I consider a Dusty promo, not with the verbiage, as we've talked about. Cody's vocabulary is a lot bigger. He doesn't make up his own words. But the cadence and the meaning and the message behind Brock Lesnar and his treachery and what he did and ended up with the way that Cody phrased it, making the people think that Brock was concerned about him. And that's why he did it. Making himself a threat to Brock Lesnar, who is way over, as we know. And so I can't do the promo justice by trying to recap it, but it was a a long roundabout way to get out a challenge that he wants to fight Brock Lesnar. And since everybody knows Brock ain't there tonight, he makes the challenge for backlash and ends up basically ordering Brock to show up next week and quote unquote, answer the call. I thought this was tremendous and did the whole promo while selling his ribs that he hurt at WrestleMania. I loved it. I don't know whether it's his idea all along or whether he's fully on board with this or whether he sat down and figured out a promo like Dusty would have if he'd have been in that position that took as much heat off of himself and put it back on the heel for the letdown at WrestleMania as possible. But that's what, to me, this did. What'd you think? I didn't like it as much as you. I thought it was good, at times really good, but I thought it went on a while and I thought, for me, it was a return a little bit to the Cody, how do I put it? To me, not buying all the words that are coming out of his mouth the way they are. Right. To be fair, I did not watch the Dusty biography before Raw. I watched it after Raw. So maybe if I had seen that. Well, I mean, yeah. And <laughs> now you've, you've, you've started out with, uh, you know, the 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 minor cut of meat and then went to the filet mignon instead of... The, well, I, get, I get what you're saying. I think for me, as someone who they hooked, they got me invested in everything that was going on, I still feel the letdown. And they're going to try to make Cody and Brock work. They're going to try to make it make sense in the bigger picture, which at this point, are we foolish? I think the bigger picture is Cody getting the belt. After everything that just happened, are we foolish to think he's going to get the belt? I don't know. But now we get Cody and Brock. That's why I say it was good and at times really good. Cody was good at trying to make some sense out of him calling out Brock Lesnar. But it doesn't replace still the feeling of what the hell's going on with Roman and the bloodline and Cody. And right. I know they're delaying it. And WWE... Traditionally, on the Vince McMahon and the matches, they love to draw things out and take your time. Now they're doing it with the angles and the storylines. But to me, everything has been a big whiff since WrestleMania Night 2. If, if Cody beats Brock Lesnar 1-2-3 in the middle of the ring at Backlash, I will go a long way toward jumping back on the ride with them and saying, okay, this is still going somewhere. If Cody does not convincingly beat Brock Lesnar after not beating Roman Reigns at all, then we, then Houston's got a problem. Do you think we're going to get Brock Lesnar? We're going to find that Brock Lesnar is in cahoots with Heyman? Probably eventually. And, and, and there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. And maybe we also find out that Brock was in cahoots with Heyman without Roman knowing about it. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then maybe uh, the Paul's reason to Roman is, well, I, I didn't want to tell you plausible deniability, my tribal chief, or whatever the fuck, and then we got more drama, but Cody can't lose two in a row, So he, and, and beating Brock Lesnar is something that a lot of people don't do, and it doesn't happen very often, and people would 
talk about it and it would register. So that part makes sense. If it's DQ count out, <laughs> Brock changes his mind that day or anything other than Cody with his hand up in the air, one, two, three, then like I said, we got a serious issue here. Do you foresee a way, do you foresee them getting Cody Rhodes as over as they had gotten him right before WrestleMania? It's, it's going to be hard because of the peck tear and because of the, the whole drama concerning the comeback. Because it was, it, was not, it was not a worked injury and people know it. They had clear visual evidence. It wasn't like just another story. This guy really did come in. We were on the, the ride with him. He was up here this far and he wanted to finish his story and all of a sudden he's fucked up and it's gruesome and he guts his way through the last match and he undergoes surgery and recovery and the packages are so good. And now he's, and now we're going to come back and we still get more chase. I'm not sure I've got enough wind for more chase. But if, if he gets turned back once, but he beats Brock Lesnar and he beats this other guy and he does whatever the fuck else and jumps some more hurdles and gets it later on this year, maybe there's... And maybe there's a chance they can five knuckle shuffle that fucking hand job back up enough to where it will be as satisfying as it was if you hadn't heard the knock on the fucking door when you were ready the last time. I'm waiting. Maybe I'm going what? too personally here. Yeah, what are you talking Nevertheless, about? Nevertheless. <laughs> Nevertheless. Maybe they can get it back to where it was and make it pop all the, the same, or maybe they can't, but every decision they make from here on out will be affecting that. That's what I think. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens next week if Brock Lesnar accepts this challenge being called out from Cody. Is that worth the fuel in the plane? That's what we'll find out. Well, it only used to be, I remember they said Crockett's plane cost $2,000 an hour to operate. So that's, you know, but that's been 35 years ago. Anyway, then the Usos beat Shoosh Boy and Otis. And they had a three-way match, which I hope was a victim of rewriting at the last minute. They didn't intend to do this with Sky of Kai and Sky against Mia Yim against Piper Niven. And then they went to Kevin Owens in the back of the arena because tonight his heart tells him he has to beat the hell out of Solo. Because <laughs> he was saying, yeah, none of my friends are here. None of my backup. I have no help. I'm not a very smart guy. I shouldn't be doing this, but you know what? My heart tells me I have to. Uh, and so does my agent. And so <laughs> the main event was Kevin Owens against Solo with the Usos in the corner. And I've seen enough interaction from these people lately. They went two minutes to the break. They came back and they had a match and they did the finish where Uso... One of the Usos, rather, hit a super kick from the floor when the referee's back was turned, and Owen staggered into solo super kick and the Samoan spike one, two, three. So these are kind of it's the same finish with different people doing it. And remember, I said that was one of Dusty's drawbacks sometime as a booker. He had his favorite finishes and he wouldn't keep track on how many times they'd been done in the same town. That's where I came in sometimes. But they've got tapes of everything they've done on television. It's always the same finish. We're going to put our time in, and then suddenly, boom, here's a way to get out of it. And then the heels get on Owens, and they're beating him up three on one, and then suddenly they get a shot. They've got a camera in the parking garage. I guess just waiting there like they when they've, the South Park local news on the school channel put butters out in front of the school to see if there was any celebrities. And he every once in a while they'd go to him and he'd be standing out there. Have you seen any celebrities, butters? No, nobody yet. Because he's all alone. They've got a camera in the parking garage just in case. And here comes Sammy and Bro Bro. Apparently Riddle dresses like that on the plane too. And they're running through the garage, but before they can come out in the arena, their music hits, so the people will pop, and then they come out, and they beat up the Usos in the aisleway, and Solo in the ring, and then the Usos in the ring again. And there at the end of the thing, well, there's Sammy and Bro Bro, 
standing with Owens and the bloodline has been run off. And what was the one glaring problem with whether this was a rewrite or whether they intended it to be this way or whether mama says it bees that way sometimes? What was the glaring problem with the whole setup of Owens being all by his lonesome? I thought the glaring problem was you deciding Matt Riddle should be called bro bro. No, that was another glaring problem. <laughs> I'm talking about the overriding glaring problem with this whole thing. I mean, it went on a little while. Is that what you mean? No, no. I don't know. Who tried to talk Sammy and Owens into fucking bearing the hatchet to begin with? Where's Cody? Where's Cody? Cody was in the building. Cody was in a suit. Only did a promo, but Cody was in the building. Couldn't there have been some way to let the people know that Cody had departed? But why would Cody depart? if they were making a big deal even before the fucking show was halfway over that Owens was all alone, all alone. No, no Sammy, no bro, bro. What about Cody? The biggest enemy of the bloodline. There's the loophole in their goddamn tapestry here. It buried him by not being involved when he was capable of being involved. Why wouldn't he have stepped up and said, I'll be in your corner tonight. And then instead of fucking beating up goddamn mediocre mid-card girl wrestlers or whatever, somebody unbeknownst to anybody took fucking Cody out of the picture. And then Owens really was alone. And then we could find out potentially that it was goddamn solo in a hood doing the behest of Heyman on behalf of Brock or who the fuck knows. But at least it would have addressed that that dangling participle. That's my that was my thought. See again, I said earlier, show Cody showing up. After his promo, if you show him leaving, it ties everything together. Well, but why would he have left if he knew that uh that Sammy and Bro Bro hadn't got there? Why this? are you calling him that now all of a sudden? Because I just hate Riddle so bad. I know, but that oh all right. Please don't start calling him that. All right. And by the way, let's talk about that if you don't mind. Why are they focusing so much on Riddle on both shows? He's now involved with the main event program. He just showed back up. Because he got out of rehab and he got the fucking PR heat off of himself, apparently, and now they still got to pay him a lot of money. So they're sticking him into something. He don't fit like a screen door on a submarine because they got to use him. See, I know they think they have an idea of where to go with all this, but... Cody not winning still feels like a massive mistake. Cody and Brock feels off because Cody should have been the champion going into it. You're adding Matt Riddle now into the mix. Roman really hasn't done too much since WrestleMania. People are going to get sick of the Usos and Solo if they're the only people you see having matches nonstop every week now. And I buy Cody and... Sammy and Kevin Owens as three unlikely partners in the same quest, but Riddle coming in being a jack off. I don't know if I buy him with any of the other people, especially Cody. Well, I don't buy him as a main eventer, and I wouldn't put him in this slot. And with that, that was WWE Raw for what was it? The 10th of April. April 10th, 2022. Perhaps you watch that program and you think, I want to sue. Well, in that case, I know exactly who I would call on the telephone if I had a telephone in my hand and a number that I knew that I could call that person on. You know who? This guy. Call Stephen P. Show or two. Still to the rest. Folks, we're running desperately late on the program today, so I will just make mention of the fact you all know if you have misapprehension or have been misapprehended in any way, Stephen P. New, the consigliere of the Cult of Cornet, newlawoffice.com, 888 692 8084. He will free you 
from the the bonds of injustice and take you to cash in the bonds of justice or money orders or personal checks or company checks or good old-fashioned cash under the table. He's amenable to whatever's convenient. Stephen P. News, the man for you. That's right. Stephen P. New, the man for you if you need to sue. Stephen P. New, we'll have more about him at the end of the show. But Jim, let's get some questions in. And a lot of the listeners of Jim Cornette's drive through have been sending in questions about Logan Paul re-signing with WWE. They want to get your thoughts on that. But more specifically, the image being put out, being photoshopped <laughs> to remove Stephanie McMahon and change the color of Logan's jacket so it appears to be a different photo. Well, I saw this, and I guess one of the... I didn't study it forensically, but I guess one of the giveaways to people with more time than I had was the the yellow drink bottle in front of him still said, like, blue raspberry or something. And the, and they And they went back and dug up a picture that had been tweeted the last time he allegedly signed a contract, and yes, Stephanie was in it, and they were standing in the same place, wearing the same clothes, they just changed the colors. And there was some kind of controversy a week or two ago where... Logan Paul had said, well, my contract has come up with the WWE. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm done with them. But he had said last year that he signed a multi-year contract and people was like, well, how can he be done? And then they just put out this picture where he supposedly, well, I've signed another contract, but it's the same picture as the last time that they put out that he signed a contract. You see why we're all confused. What are they pulling here, Brian? What are your thoughts on Logan Paul either re-signing with well, WWE no, I'm, I'm or being signed for multiple more years with WWE? I'm more interested on why did they put out the same picture and bother to change the color of everybody's clothes and the drink bottle? Well, he put it what, out. What are they trying to pull here? He put it out. It says contract renewed, and they tagged WWE on his official Twitter account. And the WWE ran with that. Okay, well, what are they all trying to hide? That's what I want to know. Why are they putting out fictitious old pictures recolorized? Who are they? Turner Classic Movies? When you signed your first WWF contract, did they give you a nice fancy folder to put it in like he got? No, I barely got a copy of the fucking thing. <laughs> Had to make my own on the copy machine. Uh, no, you didn't get a folder, you didn't get a souvenir pin, you didn't get dick all the shit. You just got the contract and then a check until they stopped sending you that. Uh, but no, I'm glad he's still around. I mean, he's been great. Um, especially now that he has somewhat apparently embraced being a heel, because remember at first, when he first came in, he, they did some kind of swerve with him and The Miz. He wanted to leave as a baby face, and he thought he would. And the people have booed him out of the building because he's an outsider. But he's, as we mentioned, tremendously athletic, and he's got the the idea of this. So I'm glad he's going to be around. Uh, just this, we've got to we've got to find out what the penalties are for falsifying contract signing photos in a publicly traded company. It's worth 21 billion dollars. Certainly three to five years in a hoose gal. Or Three to five thousand shares of stock. We will find out. Or, th or three to five years in Stamford Penitentiary. That may be the worst of all. Jim, another question. This one from Twitter using the hashtag Corny Drive Through from Ben Platt. What are your thoughts? And he has an attachment here. Realistically, where does the run come to an end, and whose record does he beat? And the list I have here. What former champions Roman Reigns will beat based on how many days they would be champion? Okay, I've I've seen this. I've seen this. Somebody went back and uh, counted all the days that the various long-running champions in the history of the company have had the title and who Roman is ahead of and who he's behind and where his next milestones are. To reach 1,000 days, it would be May 27, 2023. The approximate event would be WrestleMania Backlash 2023, around that period of time. Well, I think we're safe there because, again, if, if he didn't lose it to Cody at WrestleMania, he's not losing it to someone else different than Cody 
the very next month when Cody's on the pro on the card against Brock Lesnar. So he's good for a thousand days to beat Pedro Morales. It would be June 24th, 2023. That would be 1,028 days. The approximate premium live event would be money in the bank. I think he's good there too. I don't see him do anything that quick. Well, from Pedro to Bruno, this is interesting. To beat Bruno San Martino's first title run. No. No, actually, no. Just a, second, a, second. Second. It title. says Bruno San Martino won. That's what threw me off here. To beat Bruno's second title run in the 70s, it would be January 20th, 2024, 1,238 days, approximate premium live event, the Royal Rumble. Well, now we're stretching things. And. And by the way, we made a mistake. You did, and I went along with you, so I guess I bear some culpability. SummerSlam is not where we said it was. Oh, in Philadelphia, that's right. It, Philadelphia is WrestleMania next year, right? That's what it is. And SummerSlam is where? Detroit. It's in Detroit. What could be worse than Philadelphia? Detroit! <laughs> Well, or the the Palace at Auburn Hills. Uh, they wrecked that place. Um, I think Luger was part of the demolition crew. Um, I, I think it would be d d difficult to wait that long. I think by SummerSlam or Royal Rumble, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're going to try to stretch this out, but we're we're starting to push things now. Well, here's the big push after that. To beat Hulk Hogan, 1,475 days. It would be September 13th, 2024. The approximate premium live event, Crown Jewel 2024. Yeah, that's a year and a half from now. And they're talking about Hogan's run from, what, early 84? to it Was it the first week of January 84? 84 to 88. To 88, yeah. And so... Six, six, seven, eight, four and a half solid years. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen one way or the other, Cody or no. Well, to beat Bob Backlund's run, minus an <laughs> uh, interception from Antonio Inoki, <laughs> 2,136 days, it would be July 6th, 2026, Hell in a Cell 2026, approximately. And boy, and let's be honest, <sighs> Bob Backlund's five years uninterrupted was at the time when between 1978 and 1983, the WWF was the biggest regional territory in the world. They had the biggest buildings, they had the strongest television, you know, in those huge markets and they had amazing undercards and, and Vince Sr. was grudge pushing Bob Backlund over the last at least two years. So that was just like a, fuck you, I'm going to do what I want because I can and we're still selling out type of reign. And finally, to beat Bruno San Martino's first title run, it would be May 4th, <laughs> 2028, <laughs> 2,804 days, the approximate premium live event, WrestleMania Backlash 2028. Bruno number one from May 17, 1963 to what was it? December? No, it was January 8, 1971. That ain't going to happen uh, ever again, I don't think. Certainly not with Roman Reigns or anybody else in right now. So I think we're looking at the next 12 months. So what do you think based on all of these here? You know, again, these are just these are just how many days it would take to beat these former champions. Right. SummerSlam would fall in between Pedro and Bruno, and then of course WrestleMania would be in between Bruno and Hogan. Do any of these matter, or do you still do whatever you're going to do? Well, you still do whatever you're going to do. I mean, it's interesting factoids. I, they may be they, meaning the WWE office, may be giving serious consideration to, wow, the thousand-day thing will be cool so we could say that, but they're not, they have not, I'm sure, looked at previous champions to say, okay, we can get longer than this guy and this guy, but we can't, we'll, we'll never talk him into staying in the business long enough to beat Bruno's first run. Uh, that's immaterial to them. 
thousand days they can market that. If somebody says, you know, to the announcers, well, now you can say that he was champion longer than Pedro Morales. That might be a factoid they drop in the commentary, but it's not going to be something they hang their hat on trying to sell it. And and I th and I think we're we're within twelve months. If it ain't done by next year's WrestleMania, they're completely out of their pee picking minds. Jim, some questions from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. This one was sent. That one that's so hard to get into. That one that's so hard to get into. Just under seventy five hundred members right now, as we speak. How, how many still to be processed? <laughs> uh, tens of thousands is the okay. only thing we could approximate at this point. We're trying, folks. From Todd Montgomery, why was Jim not in Memphis Heat, and what does he think of the film? I love the film. I love the film. Uh, no, that one of the greatest documentaries on wrestling, and I've said that before when it was when we talked about it years ago when it was newer. Um, I wasn't in it. I wasn't part of. I didn't want to be in it. For one thing, nobody asked me. Uh, but I, I wouldn't have wanted to be if, if they had have, because it was part of the time when I was the fan and I was sitting home watching that stuff. It was more about the generation right before me, everybody from Fargo and Lawler to Jimmy Hart to Jerry Jarrett, the people that were really integral in building not only the promotion, but making it what it was and Dundee. And so I loved being able to watch it as a fan and it was loosely it wasn't taken from a from a book it would the idea the concept of let's do a documentary on this fascinating wrestling promotion uh was taken from you know a book of of the era of memphis wrestling when i was a fan and right before you know i got in the business and many of the stories there didn't involve me so it, just, it wasn't wasn't my thing and i certainly was more happy to see everybody else that was a big deal that I was a fan of talking about it instead of me saying shit I already knew. So yeah, Memphis Heat was one of the best documentaries on wrestling on a wrestling territory ever. And no, I was not offended not to be included. They also didn't interview Lance Russell. That's the big puzzling one to me. Well, here, and, and from what I understand also, Basically, a lot of the interviews were done in Memphis or around Memphis, and it was amongst the people. There was a, was not a ton of money behind this thing and a huge budget to fly people and crews all over the place, and that was not, that was a huge omission, but that was not during a period of time that I think that Lance ever came back and visited Memphis. He was living in Pensacola by that point. Jim, this next question from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group is from Jesus Salas Rodriguez. Will Dominic? Mis I know him. He's a good. He's a good customer of Cornet's collectibles. Will Dominic Mysterio surpass MJF as the best heel in the business before twenty twenty three ends? No. And uh, uh, that's not even. That's not an as aside or a slight to Dominic. But MJF is the, even if he's the big fish in a small pond, he's the world champion of the primary opposition promotion. He's being featured as the top guy in that atmosphere. He's, even though Dominic has done a world of good with this gimmick he's got, MJF is still, when you talk about new wrestlers, old wrestlers, veteran wrestlers, whatever, he's, if not the best, one of the two or three best verbalists in the business. And his matches, Dominic is great at the style that he's been trained and he's hanging in there and he's pulling his weight. We haven't seen that he can put together top main event world title style matches, even with a, you know, with a, an opponent besides his father and MJF has with Punk and with Danielson. And the matches that he's had on his own where he was the leader and the veteran with Darby and a blah, blah, blah. So, no, I'm not saying it might not ever happen, but right now I think MJF is firmly in the lead as far as getting the most out of their talents and is probably going to be for the next year until that bidding war. Then we'll see. Jim, another uh, topic that actually a bunch of people were sent in a question about, we just talked about Bret Hart quotes the other day. 
Apparently, Bret Hart's made another comment about John Moxley. Did you see this? I have not. This, Did he call him asking him to unstop a drain? This is <laughs> this is once again from HN Live, whatever that is. Bret Hart was asked about the current state of wrestling. Here's a quote. AEW has kind of gone in a bad direction, I think, with all the violence and gore. I watched some episodes. You know, I watched Martha Hart do her big press conference for AEW here in Calgary. I'm watching AEW, and I'm watching who used to be Dean Ambrose sticking a fork in somebody's head <laughs> for like five minutes with a close-up on TV. This isn't wrestling either. I would recommend turning all that off. I don't watch that stuff anymore. It's not very good. Wrestling is going in some bad directions because people don't know what wrestling is or what wrestling was. Boy, just like the last clip uh, we talked about, uh, the comments that he made, uh, it's hard to argue with that because, and I know somebody's going to say, oh, well, Bret Hart's uh, dad, Stu Hart, he used the Mongolian Stomper. He used Abdullah the Butcher in Stampede Wrestling, and they used forks. And the difference, again, is that today's presentation of this is so ridiculous. It's so obviously phony and over the top that you can't take it seriously, where the quote the quote in the Dusty Rhodes biography from Magnum TA was that Dusty presented violence at a level not seen today. And that everything, and, and Dave, the sports editor from The Nation, said everything seemed to be real, real adults fighting over real issues. And it's the same thing with the violence that people now assume happened rampantly in the territories because they see the clips. Well, they're picking the clips they like and the ones that survived and those are all the wild shit but there was an equal and equally long periods of time and longer periods of time where you didn't in the territories get to see a motherfucker sticking a fucking fork in a guy's head so it and, and you couldn't see all the territories at the same time so abdullah didn't do it every week on tv he did it when he was in the territory and when it was necessary to do he did it more at the house shows, which was the devoted audience that you made him pay to buy a ticket to come back and see it week after week. It wasn't, they didn't build contrived structures of furniture that they pulled out under the ring to dive off through broken glass or sheets of barbed wire or boards wrapped with razor wire that were studded with fluorescent light tubes and the guys didn't obviously visually help throw each other into and through these things that's what brett's talking about it's the the blood and gore that is obviously being done for the sake of the blood and gore and the violence and everybody's in on the fucking cooperation of it and it just looks stupid and phony and silly to do rather than as strange as it may seem to the modern fan different wrestlers, wild guys being portrayed as maniacs and capable of breaking off and going into business for themselves and doing something dangerous to somebody and nobody be able to stop them. And then they do it and nobody can. Oh shit. There's a difference in all of that. And the context is what takes it from fucking the geek show at the fair where the, the fucking goof is biting the head off a live chicken here, give him 10 cents and he'll bite another one to presenting a violent display that you get caught up in and want to pay to see more of in the resolution of. Did that work at all in English to make anybody understand or do you just have to have seen both to know the difference? I think it makes plenty of sense. The headline that made me laugh from one of these websites is Bret Hart advises fans to turn off John Moxley's matches. Well, boom goes the dynamite right. There's the best advice that he's given in a long time. And it's short and succinct. What do you think of Bret being so outspoken about modern wrestling lately? I like to hear. I it. think he's, I think he's finally just said, you know what? I don't need this anymore. 
I'm not looking for a job and I don't have to fucking say anything I don't believe to get anybody's sympathy or in, in their good graces. So here, I'll just tell the truth. Imagine that. Jim, this question from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group from Alex Hedges. Does Jim have any thoughts on the career of Brent Albright? Uh, yes, I do, and they're both good and bad. Um, We had Brent Albright here in OVW, and I'm going to say it was 2003, 4 to 5, some, somewhere around in that area. And... I thought he was a had an amateur background, excellent worker, was a bit older. I'm not talking about like 40. I'm talking about he was a he had already been in the business for a few years by the time he got to OVW. And he's probably his late 20s, so he wasn't like just a kid. And I thought he had a ton of potential and a ton of talent and had a lot of good matches for us. And then you know, about the time that they took him into the program, I can't remember because that's when I departed OVW. And I don't really know what issue or issues led to him not, you know, being successful there. And then the next time I saw him was when I came back to Ring of Honor. Um... I guess what uh was it 2009ish yeah with the uh HD net program and Brent had been wrestling in different places and was brought up for was working for Ring of Honor even before I got there in, in some shots and came up for some TVs and I will just say that Brent had some personal issues going on non-wrestling related with a relationship and personal issues going on, not wrestling related with other things, and we couldn't we couldn't do what we wanted to do with him because he wasn't in the same shape or the same mindset at that point, and there was an issue where we were concerned about reliability. And I don't know. I hope that he moved past all that stuff and is at least happier in general in life, but I don't know much about the wrestling career that he had after that, but he was a really tremendous prospect and had a lot of potential at one point. Jim from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. This was sent in by Dave Messino. Who are Jim's top five wrestlers over 350 pounds? Oh, good Lord. Um, well, we've just talked about Yokozuna here recently, and even if he you know, wasn't as agile as Bam Bam Bigelow. He was twice as heavy at one point. I mean, you know, Yoko definitely would have to be one of the top super heavyweight guys in the history of the business. And I just mentioned another one, Bigelow. Uh, but there, Crusher Blackwell. I mean, when you talk about over 350 pound wrestlers, you're including Andre and Big Show. But are they really? Do you go with the heavy wrestler or the tall wrestler who's also heavy? Um, you know, uh, Brown Strongman is billed at over 350 pounds, but does anybody look at him like the gimmick of a a King Kong Bundy or a, uh, a Crusher Blackwell or, you know, somebody like that? And, you know, uh, fuck, um... Matt Morgan at one point was closing in on 350 when he was bodybuilding and or, you know, muscle building, but he was also almost seven feet tall. So that doesn't put him in the same body type as a Bronson Reed. So I think if you're looking for big guys instead of tall guys, I think Yoko, Bigelow, Blackwell, who am I fucking missing? I've just named Vader. a couple more. Vader, obviously. Vader who went anywhere from 370 to 420, but was still only about six foot three. So, and and there, and you know, the WWF or WWE got most of those guys because that was Vince's wheelhouse or flywheel or whatever the fuck. So when you talk about Vader and Yoko and Bam Bam. You know, and that boss man. Yeah. Boss man, depending on 
time of the year, he was above or below 350 for a lot of time. John Tenta. Earthquake, and not the necessarily the earthquake that you saw in 1995 in the WWF doing sumo matches with Yoko, but (laughs) Earthquake John Tenta in Japan in his younger days because of the size, his body broke down a little more quickly. But what a fucking athlete he was in his younger days. So, I mean, you'd have to sit down and make out a list. And and then if we're talking all time, I'm sure Martin the Blimp Levy was the drizzling shits to watch, but he drew a lot of money because there was nobody like him then. Haystack Calhoun, same thing. Everyone knew that name. Yes, he was legitimately one of the one of the wrestlers in the late 50s, early 60s because of his, especially the TV that he was on in the Northeast, that if you just you went to a store or a shopping center someplace and yelled out Haystacks Calhoun, people would know that name even if they didn't watch wrestling because it just stood out. And he was, I mean, everybody said this. He was one of the worst workers in the business. And I've seen some film when he was in his heyday in the early 60s and it was fucking rotten but it was a simpler time and nobody was that big and people bought the horseshoe and the gimmick and at least it wasn't happy humphrey and at least it wasn't happy (laughs) humphrey because as bad as haystacks calhoun was he wasn't nearly as bad as happy humphrey and calhoun had two or three things he could do he could take a bump through the ropes to the floor that looked and he was the shape of a beach ball. They said 601, he was legitimately 500. I'm I'm sure at some point in his career. But he could take a bump through the ropes that looked like it was accidental, he didn't mean to do it and it fucked him up when he landed. And that's the way he'd lose a lot of his matches. And he could do a couple of other things but punches and any kind of work and he had no stamina. They were all the shits, but The name, the gimmick, the horseshoe, and the size. That's what worked. Over 350 pounds. Is there anyone you could think of? Who's the best big man in the history of Memphis? Or the Memphis promotion, Nashville promotion? Well, see, once again, I mean, you know, for years it would have been Plowboy Frazier. And my God, he could do the best leg drop of anybody that size I've ever seen. And otherwise, Nat, he was a shits. All the big guys had one or two things they could do. I'm trying to think of... uh, Memphis didn't usually use a lot of guys that big on a regular basis because, one, most of the guys were smaller and they it would make them look visually even smaller and the big guys couldn't keep up with the action. But if they did get a big guy, they would use him as a monster and build a gimmick and build the card around him. They wouldn't just a lot of time put him on the fucking show. They would make something out of him. And then he'd be gone fairly quickly because he wouldn't be able to last. We probably should have put Andre on our list. Well, I remember I mentioned Andre when I was talking about, are we talking about the tall guys yeah, that's true. That's true. that have to weigh that much? Or are we talking about the, the guys that are just like the Bronson Reed of today or the Bam Bam Bigelow of, 20 years ago is that they're just unnaturally large. Who would you prefer, Bigelow or Vader? You know, personally, or prof- <laughs> you're the booker, you're the promoter. You need to have well, one no. big guy on the card. Bam Bam was more fun to be around in the locker room. Leon was probably, Bam Bam was a more agile athlete Leon was even bigger and heavier and could portray that he was hitting harder, better. Bam Bam was a better worker. Leon was a more fearsome monster. Bam Bam was probably more flexible, but at the same time, Leon just had that aura about him of violence that Bam Bam... In real life, Bam Bam was probably as bad, if not a badder ass, than Leon in terms of if you got in a street fight. But Leon portrayed more violence, I think. And remember, Bam Bam's original gimmick, the way he looked in Memphis when he made his debut and the first, you know, little while he was in the business, was not 
a superhero full body outfit with flames on it. It, it was jeans and a, he looked like a fucking street gang member at 400 pounds with tattoos on his fucking head. So if you'd have followed that and if he'd have been, if he'd have been more established as a, just a fucking violent convict looking motherfucker like that, then that look would have probably been better for him. I thought all around than when he got, he got to Vince real early and got superheroed up. And then you've got a guy with the flames tattooed over his whole bald head, 400 pounds that can do cartwheels and drop kicks, but he's dressed like a superhero. And now he's teaming with doink the clown. Took some of the edge off of it. Should they have made him an arsonist? Oh, come on now. I actually like the full body outfit with the flames. I actually think that's kind of an iconic look and it worked for him. Yeah, but at the same point, he was another guy who, if, if he'd have gone in the opposite direction, I could have seen Bam Bam working with fucking anybody in the NWA working with flair for the title as a baby face or working against dusty as a heel, as a monster heel, like big Bubba Rogers with the, the real life violence that was some part of Bam Bam's life was never brought out to make him any more fearsome than his size already made him. He could have been a lot scarier motherfucker. If you'd have concentrated on the scary things about him in real life. Do you think Vader could have gotten a match at a Lawrence Taylor that Bam Bam did? No. No, Vader would have... <sighs> it either would have stunk or Vader would have just fucking stiffed him until Taylor just fucking curled up in a ball. But he... Leon was not the kind of worker that could do the things necessary to get a match like that out of a complete novice. Bam Bam was. So once again, you're the promoter, you're the booker, you need one big guy on your show, I guess one agile big man. Who do you pick, Vader or Bam Bam? What year is it? 1990, 1993. Vader. 1988. Bam Bam. 1990. Yeah, we might have to flip a coin. <laughs> okay, all right. Jim, this next one sent in. From the Cult of Cornet Facebook group from John Rousen. What is Jim's all-time favorite tag team match from history? Oh, good Lord. Uh, I, I... And let's take you out of it. A match that you're not involved in. Let's start with that. Then you can answer the favorite tag match you were involved in. Well, I, I can't even answer that. Um, and see, here's the thing. What the the best match or the best house show match that nobody ever saw again. Cause it wasn't taped or the best pay-per-view match Not or the best. best match that, or favorite, favorite. The, my favorite one, but the favorite one that was it. Cause it, my favorite, cause it drew the most money or I got paid the most, or it was the best match or it tore the house down the most or, and that would just be if I was involved. And then all that I've seen, my God, that it goes back to, I remember, and you will shit all over this, but in 1975, one of the best tag team matches that I ever saw was a coal miners tag team match. Ooh. Phil Hickerson and Dennis Condry against George Goulas and Pez Watley. Wow, where'd you see that? In Louisville at the Gardens. And because Hickerson and Condry were so good and they worked the fucking coal miners gimmick so well. And Pez Watley was good in those days. And George didn't get in the way as much as usual. And at the end of it, it was one of those matches. You're like, well, goddamn, I didn't think that was going to be anywhere near that good. But, you know, then all the, the Japanese tag team matches, the dream tag matches that we saw on tape in the, in the 80s and early 90s and everything. You know, I, I saw, to be honest, I saw matches in Memphis Two out of three weeks. It wasn't two weeks in a row, I don't think. I was there, then I missed one, then I came back. But I saw two tag team matches with Dory and Terry Funk versus Jerry Lawler and Jack Briscoe and Dory and Terry Funk versus Jerry Lawler and Plowboy Frazier. Guess which one was not really that good and guess which one was one of the best tag team matches <laughs> I'd seen up to that point. Really? I'm surprised to hear that. I can figure out the answer based on what you're saying. Why do you think that was? Because... 
It was the middle of the blood feud between Lawler and Funk, and Jimmy Hart was bringing Terry Funk into the territory. But when Dory came in, Dory and Briscoe wrestled, and we got to see the Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe shit, the arm drags and all that stuff, and it was great for me. But the people wanted to see wild, crazy bullshit like they'd been led to believe they were going to see, and Jack Briscoe and Dory Funk Jr. didn't do that. So a couple weeks later, they come back, and in the place of Briscoe is Plowboy Frazier, and Jimmy Hart is hung over the ring by a fucking truss so that he had just a rope that they stuck him in, a little goddamn seat, and it was like he was being held out by a fucking fishing pole. But he was hung over the ring, and it was a Texas death match. Falls don't count. Match continues till they can't answer the bell. Anything goes. And they're plowboys in the spirit of things. And Dory had to keep up, because now they got the table in the ring, and Lawler's going crazy, and the people are going crazy. It was a better match because it fit the program, and it was more of what the people not only expected, but were educated to enjoy. And that tore the house down. So, but at the same time, <laughs> Jack Briscoe and Dory Funk Jr. drew money in every territory in the fucking country 10 years previously, fighting for the world heavyweight title because that was their presentation, and that was what the people expected from them. It was the equivalent of, you know, the modern-day Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit or whatever, the in-ring technical gold standard for competitive athletic wrestling without any bullshit. That's what they were. But it had to be presented that way. So, you know, you can never tell what's going to be the best thing, just tear a fucking house down. And then, I mean, last year, FTR and the Briscoes. We didn't just see one match that would stand up, you know, to, to any of the all-time matches. We saw three of them in the same year from the same two teams. So I can't just pick a favorite, you know, out of 50 fucking years, either being involved or just watching stuff. But sometimes they're ones you wouldn't expect. Well, Jim, this next question was sent via email, the corny drive through at gmail.com from Joe Musolf in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I know Joe, by the way, and you mangled his name, but we'll get by it. Let's face it, Edge's comeback run in WWE has been mediocre at best. He hasn't done anything memorable besides losing the Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. I forgot about that. That's a Oh, I did too. If Edge returned to wrestling in AEW, instead, he could have given the promotion the presence of a legit main eventer, and he could mentor any young wrestler in <laughs> AEW who would be willing to listen. Do you think Edge would have been better off if he had returned to wrestling in AEW instead of WWE? Or would a hypothetical run in AEW for Edge go off the rails the way it has with, say, Chris Jericho? Well, besides that, he might end up in traction, but you're talking about a guy who retired for 10 years because of a serious neck surgery. And now you want to put him in that environment where there is no control, no quality check, no limiter or governor on these fucking young guys that think they can do everything. Besides the fact that that wasn't his atmosphere and that he wanted to come back because obviously he had unfinished business. He didn't want to retire that way. It was forced on him, but he wanted to come back on a main stage, not wrestle a full-time schedule, but still make very good money and make a difference. And that's in the environment that he had spent his entire career in. He would be looked at if he went to AEW at that point and coming back to wrestling after that long and then going to AEW like he was doing it for a money grab. Um, also there would have been fewer people that he would probably have felt comfortable about working with. Uh, they've had experienced veterans. How did, how did Joe phrase it? Experienced veterans or talented professionals or whatever there before. And they've all floundered the booking or whatever the fuck. Look at the injury rate there, even to the legends, poor Matt Hardy. They brain damaged him about five fucking times. It, and and he would have been 
he would have been choosing a smaller platform to do the limited amount of wrestling that he has left instead of the biggest company in the world where he'd spent almost his entire career. It, it, that I don't see that being a decision at all. Come back and do part-time shit in AEW with, with who for what? To the argument that they could have used him on top of the card more than WWE has used him on top of the card. Any merit to that, you think? Well, would you rather be on the top of a card in a phone booth or in the middle of a card in a fucking stadium? And does he, did he want, did he want to come back after 10 years out from career ending neck surgery? And instead of working a part-time schedule with a group that he originally, I guess, put together and maybe they didn't figure they were going to split him up that quick or just go over there and wrestle random people on the AEW roster, even if it was guaranteed money to, you know, to do the short bit of business that he had left in the wrestling industry over there. I, I, I guess it wasn't attractive to him and I don't see why it would have been. But you agree that his comeback, his return to WWE, there's been something missing, would you say? I, at first there wasn't, and then I think it when they took him out of Judgment Day. That's remember we liked that original group, and it looks like there was a purpose. Edge, the veteran that could talk, and get the younger talent over, and then all of a sudden he was summarily excommunicated, and Finn Balor joined, which is like replacing, you know, goddamn James Dean with Opie Taylor, and. And it just then it it just kind of went different ways, and we got less interested. So I I think it started out good. I don't know if you know everything's been great since then. All right, Jim. Our next question sent via email to corny drive through at gmail dot com. Trying to figure out if this guy wants his name read. It's signed sincerely. He, a, he might want his name blue or green. It's signed sincerely a fiery Lacey Evans fan. <laughs> Please answer this. You guys have the biggest wrestling podcast in the world, so people actually pay attention to what you say, even if they pretend not to. Yeah. And this could help her career by putting her name out there. Hi, Brian and Jim. I've been listening to you guys every day at work for almost two years now, and it makes the day fly by. Thank you. Keep up the good work, and keep the content coming. I'm a big fan of Lacey Evans. She's one of the few reasons why I watch WWE, and it is incredibly frustrating not seeing her on TV with each passing week. Everyone seems to agree that she is good, especially as a heel, and that she has potential to be a star. Jim said, and I quote, I'm in love with Lacey Evans. He also said he could see her feuding with top stars as a heel. Brian also acknowledged that she was very good, and he was happy that Jim came to the same conclusion. That put a huge smile on my face when I heard that from you both. What can be done to salvage this bad situation? <laughs> Why doesn't Triple H see her potential, or book her accordingly? This is a selfish thought that I've had for a while, but if Vince coming back to power means that Lacey Evans will get her pushback, <laughs> because it was rumored that she was one of his favorites. Well, then I'm all for it. Even if the rest of the talent suffers. <laughs> Even if the rest of the talent suffers because she is my favorite wrestler currently, and I believe she is that good. She has always been a heat magnet. She cuts a decent promo. She looks great. She has had feuds and pay-per-view matches with Becky, Bailey, Sasha, and Charlotte. In her feud with Sasha and Bailey, she even started getting babyface Lacey Evans chants. Rhea is getting babyface reactions right now. Maybe Lacey is the heel to face her. She's got the size to match Rhea. Please, if you have the time. Share your thoughts on what can be done. Well, we did have the time, but this letter has gone on so long. It's so frustrating as a fan to see her have a down moment. It's even more frustrating when it seems like everyone but the booker recognizes and respects her talent. Thank you again. 
even if you aren't able to answer this <laughs> and keep up the good work, sincerely a fiery Lacey Evans fan. Well, I'd love to be able to answer that, but we're out of time. Join us next week. No. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, before we even started watching, she's been there for a while. I don't know what she was doing before. Remember, we came in at a period of time where she was doing the Southern Belle thing where she was dressed up in frilly lace with a parasol, and she would just make an entrance, come out to the ring, twirl the parasol, and turn around and leave again. And there was Lacey Evans. Well, that was fucking rotten. Then there was the thing where she started doing some stuff in the ring, and I only remember that because there was the time where she did the thing where you bend over to go in the ring, you know, you're a woman, you show off your ass, but the camera, like, marched forward and zoomed at the same time. <laughs> it, would, it would zoom, yes, right up into her fucking anal orifice, where you could see what she had for dinner. <sighs> um, and then, remember the hostage statements where she came out there and was subjected to week after week talking about her abusive family and her unhappy childhood and her alcoholic uh, fucking family members and whatever the fuck else. And then the, she was in the army and then she was a patriot and it was presented as an American hero that would then come out and tell everybody what an American hero she was and how they were a bunch of ungrateful dipshits. And somehow they made this mistreated, child who served her country into an obnoxious fucking heel but then she had the matches and we said my god what a heel she is she's great she's got the size she looks great she has the demeanor and the facials and she can talk like a bitch and what a great heel she'd be and then she disappeared again and stop and start and back and forth i don't know I don't know what the problem has been. I don't know why they have stopped and started this girl and gave her umpteen different personas and personalities. It's the most baffling thing I've ever seen. She would be a no-brainer of anybody on the WWE female roster past Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley. Lacey Evans is the one that I would take next try to figure out something to do with. And they apparently have uh, themselves. They've figured out, send her home and hide her. That's the only thing I can figure out. Yeah, it's weird because not too long ago, a video started going around of, I guess, Sammy Guevara when he tried out for WWE or NXT, whatever it may be. And one of the coaches yelling at him was Lacey Evans, but I think that was even from before <laughs> she was like on TV. So I'm not exactly sure where she came from, who she is. I don't know what the hell's going on with her. Where did you come from, baby? And where have you gone? Very talented from everything we've seen, but... Well, you know what she did, though, don't you? She proved me right. How's that? She went away, and old fucking Farquhar there is missing her. Let's end with one last question and a song, and then we'll get out of here, if that's okay with you. Oh, I guess. This one was sent via the Cult of Cornet Facebook group from Kent Ryan. Wouldn't you call ECW the last true territory? It was regional. It operated on a small budget. It had some terrible talent, but also bred some great, as well as being a stopping ground for, a stopping over spot, excuse me, for legends such as Steve Austin and Brian Pillman. So many fans tried to, and still try to say, ECW was on par with WWF and WCW, but they weren't, not even close, in my opinion, they were the last great territory to exist. What are your thoughts? Uh, I have to respectfully disagree, but, and not, I'm not going to knock ECW here, but they didn't fit the definition of a territory, and I will elaborate. A territory, and Smoky Mountain Wrestling just barely did, and I'll, t I'll tell you why, because and you, Brian, probably know better about their television coverage and their live event schedule. But to be a territory, for one thing, ECW was not regional. It was primarily the headquarters were located in Philly and the Northeast around Happy Heyman's house. And But they, they syndicated their television, even though not on terribly many local broadcast stations, but on enough of the 
low power station services, the Channel Americas, America One Network. They were trying to get the sports channels. They had television in different places from Florida to the Midwest, whatever. So they weren't trying to be a territory in terms of having local broadcast television in their regular markets that they ran on a regular, either weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Did they ever have television on a broadcast television outlet, or was it all cable? Uh, it was pretty much, I think it was all cable because it was Sports Channel Philadelphia when it was just local in Philadelphia. When it came to New York, it was on the MSG network, which is, uh, you know, local sports network here in New York, Sunshine Network in Florida. So I don't think it was ever broadcast. And I'm not, again, I'm not, because it was hard to get TV in that era. I barely did with Smoky Mountain in smaller markets. But as a matter of fact, since Bill Barron's and was uh, monitoring a lot of this and, and working with uh, the sponsors and the advertisers on the per inquiry spots and 1-800 buy this shit and everything. He had the coverage maps with Channel America, America One Network, their sports channel stuff in Philadelphia, our broadcast outlets in Smoky Mountain. We had more, we were available in more homes than Paul was in 93, 94, and 95. But again, that was because we were available. It's like C-SPAN is available in a lot of homes. Sometimes people don't watch that channel. They weren't watching a lot of the channels either one of us were on. Paul also didn't run a live event schedule that would fit the definition of territories. Did what, Basically, he would run Fridays and Saturdays, right? Was it every weekend? Was that toward the end? Was it only a couple weekends? I remember in the mid-90s when we were in more direct competition. But it a territory... Go ahead. It wasn't necessarily every weekend, especially early on, but they started adding little towns. They started adding Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, and Reading, Pennsylvania, the Lulu Temple. There are lots of little places they added. Okay, well, but the point is, a territory, by strict definition... All the territories in the territory days, you had local broadcast television in all of your regular markets. You ran a steady schedule of live events. And that's why I say Smoky Mountain barely qualified because we ran generally 12 to 15 a month. And that's enough to send Knoxville every month, Johnson City every month, Barberville, Kentucky every month, etc., there were regular towns, there were spot shows, and there was enough of a schedule you could say it was almost full. But for a territory in the territory days to run less than 25 live events a month, that meant they were about to go out of business probably. And an another thing is just the, the territory booking system of having ongoing programs between clearly defined baby faces and heels and the the booking of same paul was more the first major independent promotion with television rather than the last territory of the territory days i would and because smoky mountain closed in 95 jarrett jerry jarrett didn't sell to Lawler and Larry Burton, get out of the business till 97, I still claim that Memphis was the last territory to go out of business because it legitimately was, and for so long filled every parameter of being a territory. And it didn't go under till 97. So that was the last of the territories. Despite being developmental, do you consider OVW a territory? OVW was not a territory. It was modeled after a territory and done on a small scale. We didn't have multiple TV markets and regular towns. We had we had the Louisville TV market. We had our, our TV down in London, Kentucky at the, the local Channel 9, and we got one of the low-power affiliates in Lexington for a while, and Les had us a low-power affiliate in Cincinnati for a while. But really, it was a training territory and wrestling school that was modeled after the idea of a territory, but there was really only one market and the towns were satellite spot shows of the Louisville market where it could give guys the, the flavor of it. They didn't, they didn't have to be in the car for four hours each way. They could be in the car for an hour, an hour and a half each way, but they got the experience. 
they did they weren't working a regular town every night of the week, but they were working a regular town at least one night a week. And they weren't doing television that was being seen in a variety of markets, but they were doing live to tape television and getting experience with it. So all the features you would get of a territory, we tried to give to the guys, but we kept it in a smaller geographic area. So it was kind of like a model territory in terms of like a model car, a smaller version of the real thing. Even though ECW ended up losing a lot of money, and the wrestlers, some in some cases, the wrestlers lost a lot of money too. When you go back to the beginning, the original concept of ECW once it got on TV, and once Todd Gordon hired Eddie Gilbert to come up there and book, which was, I want to have a Memphis-style promotion. Swami's going in the background, I apologize. <laughs> Those early days when it was just Philadelphia, they were on TV, Eddie was living up there and booking. Swami's really going, something's really going on outside. My question at some point was going to be, do you think ECW had to, again, without the losing money portion of it, morph to what it was because it couldn't have survived as the territory they tried to make it early on in 92, 93? Had to may be a strong comment, but probably the reason they did, there's two, several reasons they did. Number one, the reason why that nobody was ever able to take the New York Northeast Territory away from Vince McMahon was because it was the most populated, most expensive, most valuable territory in the country in wrestling, because that's where all the people lived and all the big buildings and the big TV markets and blah, blah, blah. And for Todd Gordon or anybody else to delude themselves into thinking that they, when that's what originally it was, we're going to have Philly and then we're going to branch out to New York or go to whatever and get TV and run all these towns for them to think that they were going to start any kind of regular territory in the most expensive part of the country to do it was probably delusional on their part. But, and I can see when Paul came in, Paul having not only the WCW and TBS experience, but Paul thinking big. Paul always thought big. Paul just a lot of times didn't pay the bills big. But Paul Lee wanted a national promotion from the start. He didn't want to run a fucking territory based in Philly that would go to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and, you know, fucking Reading, Pennsylvania, or whatever. He wanted to be on national TV. He wanted to do pay-per-view. He wanted. He just didn't have the money to do it, but he was going to bullshit and bluff his way through it. And that's when they started changing to that. But they would have never been able to, to get on legitimate broadcast television in Philadelphia or New York even 30 years ago would have been $5,000 a fucking week minimum for a bad time slot on a weaker station. The reason why I went to Knoxville was because you could get on television there and you could rent the arenas there. We rented the Knoxville Civic Coliseum, a 6,000-seat building, for the same price that Paul was probably paying for the ECW arena. And you could get on television and you could run shows in those markets and you could get sponsors because it wasn't New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, the big city. Everybody's out after the fucking money, blah, blah, blah. You could afford to do it. That's why it was a realistic thing that could have been done, and for several years it was done. And no, we didn't make any money, but over a four-year period for what we did, we didn't really lose a lot of money. And if it was one... One hundredth or so of Rick Rubin's, you know, net worth, he kind of could write that off on his taxes, and I don't think he suffered for it. But when you've got Todd Gordon, a jeweler in Philadelphia, trying to foot bills like that in cities like that and union places and all that other stuff, that's where he ran out of fucking money. Well, we have run out of fucking time. <laughs> Let's end on a positive note. And of course, you can hear more positivity wherever you find the Jim Cornette Experience and Jim Cornette's podcast, wherever you find your favorite podcast. And this weekend on the Jim Cornette Experience, 
wherever you find your favorite podcast. Go through the archives, patreon.com slash cornet. For $5 a month, you get to go through the archive back to 2013, the very beginning, patreon.com slash cornet. Where it all began. Go to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Subscribe today. Full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections, and very often an advanced preview of what you're going to hear on the next episode. Clips go up very often before the show goes up. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Subscribe today. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com and available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And don't forget about the wrestling news every day for free. A morning wrestling newscast with no opinion, just news. Get it directly at thewrestlingnews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And speaking of places to go, Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. What's going on, Jim? Well, the big breast cancer figures. Let's kick cancer in the ass and get my pink figure in the process, complete with the pink tennis racket, too, which is adorable. Also, the Inside the Ropes magazine, the DVD, all kinds of T-shirts and other stuff, jimcornette.com. At jimcornette.com. Of course, the drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until this weekend on The Experience and next week right back here on The Drive-Thru, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!